Okay, live is up. Sergeants, will you begin your recordings? Cloud recording is up. Sergeant Polite, you may begin to open. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to the remote hearing on education. Will council members and staff please turn on their videos at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Traeger, we are ready to begin. Good morning and welcome to today's virtual hearing on meeting the needs of students with disabilities in the COVID era and on a pre-considered resolution in support of state legislation to provide a remote learning option when community transmission of COVID-19 is at a substantial or high level. I'm Councilmember Mark Traeger, Chair of the Education Committee. A little more than one year ago, on October 22nd, 2020, this committee held an oversight hearing on reopening schools and the impact on students with disabilities. COVID-19 continues to shine a bright light on the inequities we know already exist. And as I declared then, all is not well for any of our city's nearly 1 million students. And it is definitely nowhere near well for more than 200,000 students with disabilities who have already been historically neglected under the current education system. Here we are one year later, and I think things are even more challenging and in some cases even more worse than they were before. In recent days, we have learned that the city's special education academic recovery program will begin in December, nearly three months into the school year. We have been dealing with this pandemic since March, 2020. We already knew students with disabilities and their families were not having uh, their academic needs fully met by the city. And we could intelligently deduce uh, that the COVID-19 pandemic would further exacerbate those deficiencies and add to them. When we reopened schools in September 2020 for the 2020-21 school year, the administration should have been hard at work preparing to launch the Special Education Academic Recovery Plan for the first day of school on September 13th, 2021. The administration did announce the New York City Academic Recovery Plan on July 8th, 2021, which was supposed to address the impacts on learning for all students resulting from COVID-19 pandemic. To help students with disabilities recover from, from, from learning loss, the academic recovery plan specified that the DOE would launch after school and Saturday programs for students with IEPs to receive additional instruction and related services specific to what their IEP mandates. We now sit here on November 18th, and not only have special education recovery services not yet begun for thousands of kids, but there has also been very little information provided about the implementation plan. I received more information uh, on this plan recently from a Chalkbeat uh, article, uh, quite frankly, than I have uh, from, from folks in the admin, although in, in recent days, we have gotten some more information, which I, I will, I will uh, Share, share shortly, but nowhere near enough information that, that, that we, we can have to conclude the state of, of this program. Parents and students too have been kept in the dark. We hear over and over that communication should, uh, will be improved, but time and time again, we find it in the administration and the DOE is behind the curve. Uh, we heard yesterday that a, at a District 75 town hall with DOE, uh, it was revealed that uh, some folks, some parents con shared concerns that there would be no busing for children to attend special education recovery services, either in the mornings, after school, or on Saturdays. Uh, I don't even know where to begin on that, uh, although I, I am told that there might be some uh, breaking news uh, on that today, which I, I want to hear more shortly. Uh, we've also heard that there are serious uh, staffing issues, and I want to I say even more bold than that, there are staffing issues. It's not that I'm hearing about it, there are staffing issues. And the administration needs to come clean on how severe they are in, uh, facing our schools, uh, which are a major hurdle 
in implementing after school and Saturday recovery programs. Uh, apparently principals are having difficulty finding enough staff, especially licensed special education teachers who are uh, willing to work overtime in these programs. And I'm still hearing anecdotal reports about a continuing shortage of paraprofessionals. Uh, at our hearing on October uh, 22nd, I said that the administration and DOE must do more, must redouble their efforts to provide students with disabilities an education equivalent uh, to students without IEPs. All of our children need to make sure that their needs are, are, are being met. That, that is on us, that's our obligation. It is just not happening. It now seems that we have taken steps backwards and things are rapidly unraveling. There is little more than one month left in this council's session. Uh, this council and this committee have fought hard to raise the voice of students with IEPs and their families uh, to ensure that their basic needs are met, to hold this administration and the DOE accountable. And yet, as the administration prepares to exit office, things appear to be collapsing. If the administration was, was more focused on delivering the legally mandated services that students with disabilities are entitled to, and less on advancing political agendas early in the morning on cable TV, then maybe we would be in a different spot today. Uh, this committee will also hear testimony today on a, on a pre-considered resolution that I'm proud to sponsor along with council member Rivera and public advocate Williams calling upon the New York state legislature to pass and the governor to sign uh, Senate uh, Bill 7381, Assembly Bill 8283, to require any public school located in a city with a population of 1 million or more to provide a remote learning option when community transmission of COVID-19 is at a substantial or high level. When the mayor announced last spring that there would be a return to full-time in-person instruction for all students this year with no remote option, many parents in New York City expressed real concerns, serious concerns about their children's safety. As a result, some parents chose to keep their children home rather than risk potential health consequences. These students have subsequently had no formal instruction from the DOE so far this year, further exacerbating uh, their learning uh, loss. This never would have happened if the administration had continued to offer a re remote option, something that I called for as a sensible thing to do during an ongoing pandemic. I wanna thank everyone who was testifying today. I wanna to thank the city council staff for all their work they put in uh, Malcolm Butehorn, uh, Jan uh, Atwell, uh, Aaliyah Reynolds, uh, Chelsea Bailemore, Messi Sarkissian, and Frank Perez. I also want to thank my staff, Anna Scaife, Vanessa Ogle, Maria Henderson, and Janine Caracchetti. Finally, I want to thank all the parents and advocates who have joined us today and educators in all of our prior remote hearings throughout this pandemic. Uh, you have patiently waited to testify, share your thoughts, concerns, ideas, and frustrations, and I'm thankful and we hear all of you. I will now turn it over to today's moderator, Aaliyah Reynolds, a policy analyst for this committee. Thank you, Chair Traeger. I'm Aaliyah Reynolds, policy analyst to the Education Committee. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff and Zoom will prompt you to accept the unmute. I will be calling on public witnesses to testify in panels after the conclusion of the administration's testimony and council member questions. So please listen for your name to be called. Council members who have questions should use the Zoom hand raise function. In Zoom, you will be called on in the order with which you raised your hand after the full panel has completed testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. Please note that for the purpose of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions. For public panelists, after you are unmuted, please listen for the Sergeant at Arms to give you the, head, the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. Please do not read your testimony verbatim. All written testimony will be read by committee members and committee staff. So please be sure to email it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Testimony will be accepted for 72 hours following the close of this hearing. The Sergeant at Arms will prompt you when you when your two minutes is up at that point, we ask that you please wrap up your comments so we can move to the next panelist. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Christina Foti, Deputy Chief Academic Officer. Dr. Linda Chen, Chief Academic Officer. Josh Wallach, Deputy Chancellor. John Hamer, Deputy Chief Executive Director. Lauren Siciliano, Chief Administrative Officer. Kevin Moran, Chief Schools Operation Officer. 
Anna Remenschneider, Chief of Staff, Division of Multilingual Learners. I will first read the oath and after I will call on each panelist here from the administration individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Christina Foti. I do. Dr. Chen. I do. Josh Wallet. I do. John Hamer. I do. Lauren Siciliano. I do. Kevin Moran. I do. Aaron Remenschneider. I do. Thank you. Christina Foti, whenever you're ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for unmuting me. Good morning, Chair Trager and all members of the Education Committee here today. My name is Christina Foti, and I'm the Deputy Chief Academic Officer for the Division of Specialized Instruction and Student Support. Also joining me today are Chief Academic Officer Linda Chen, Deputy Chancellor Josh Wallach, Chief Administrative Officer Lauren Siciliano, Chief Schools Operation Officer Kevin Moran, and colleagues from the DOE. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the DOE's efforts to meet our students, the needs of our students with disabilities in this challenging time. We certainly appreciate the opportunity to share our progress and plans in this area. The DOE has been unwavering in its commitment to serving students with disabilities throughout the pandemic, including safely in person as much as possible and as soon as possible. As you know, when we committed to reopening for in-person learning, in, the, in full, students with disabilities continue to be at the forefront of our planning. And as the city's recovery continues, we are continuing to lead in addressing the ongoing needs of our students with disabilities and their families. Nothing has brought me more joy than seeing our students back to learning with their teachers in their classrooms. The disruption to education from, from the pandemic has affected all students and families in New York City, but not equally. We know that many of our most vulnerable students, including the and students with IEPs, are significantly impacted by the pandemic. Our response is guided by the imperative to support every student in their recovery. And with that vision in mind, pardon me, we have begun unprecedented efforts to deliver additional services to all students with IEPs in the DOE schools citywide. This administration with federal stimulus funding and the support of an advocacy of this council has made a historic investment in addressing the needs of our students with disabilities through a commitment of $251 million on special education recovery services. Special education recovery services encompass instruction, intervention, related service and related services targeted to each student's individual needs. They are in addition to, not instead of, a student's regular school day and IEP programs and services. This school year, our goal is for every DOE school to offer special education recovery services through extended day or Saturday programs so that every student with an IEP has access to these critical services. Throughout the pandemic, our teachers and providers closely monitored students' progress towards their IEP goals. This summer, we re reviewed this information along with other factors, such as whether or not students have been in temporary housing or without uh, need, needed bilingual special education programs to identify students with the greatest need for recovery services. Starting in July, we began hiring and partnering with the necessary service providers to make this initiative a reality. We have hired or in the process of hiring an additional 350 speech teachers and 150 occupational therapists. In addition to local staff postings, principals are authorized to bring on providers from other schools and other boroughs and contract agencies are also available to provide services as needed. Schools also have the opportunity to, to partner with community-based organizations to bolster their staffing and program offerings. 
With all of this planning, we are thrilled to have the implementation of this historic investment underway. Each school has received the prioritization level for their students with instructions to use their own knowledge to identify students who need higher level of support or prioritization. For the highest priority students, services will begin as soon as possible if they have not started already. The Special Education Recovery Initiative offers these additional services to our students without any need for parents to make a formal request, easing administrative burdens on families and educators alike. As I speak, schools are reaching out to parents to develop individualized plans for, for special education recovery services for every student, taking into account parents' input and preferences. Already, schools have contacted parents to develop recovery service for services for thousands of students with IEPs and DOE schools. Along with the extended day and Saturday programming as part of the Special Education Recovery Initiative, we have made significant investments to ensure schools are equipped to provide targeted literacy and math interventions for students with IEPs, as well as students without IEPs who are at risk or identified as in need based on screener results. We have allocated $5 million in funding for the training of teachers and paraprofessionals and more than 2,300 have been trained since May of 2020. With, the flex, with flexibility and funding that also allows schools to purchase intervention materials for students, for teachers and students. Given the size of our city, the ambitious scope of this work requires a heroic effort and the shared commitment of our schools, teachers, related service providers, our families, our advocates, and each of you. New York City is making an enormous investment in providing our students with disabilities and is poised to deliver additional services to students more comprehensively than we have ever done before. While we continue to focus our efforts on the new special education recovery initiative, the special education process in general remains intact. When a student may need a change to their IP, for example, to add counseling, Schools are instructed to follow standard procedures for determining students need to develop IEPs through collaborative discussions among the student's teacher, their parents, their and their providers. Throughout the school year, our, our, our IEP teams will consider parent requests for services addressing each student's current individual needs through IEPs and recovery services while taking into account parent input and concerns at every stage of the process. As reflected in public reports required by this committee's legislation, leading up to the pandemic, we had seen consistent and substantial year-over-year -year improvements in the timeliness and completeness of special education service delivery. We share the, commitments belie the, the committee's belief that transparency helps to promote accountability toward our goal of seeing all students are fully served. With this in mind, alongside of the public reports newly required in 2021, we be began to report on the service delivery broken out by superintendent responsibility. Historically high levels of service provision followed. Of course, last year's blended learning conditions made data collection challenging. Uh, however, we are doing all we can to track and monitor that data. We also uh, work are working on proposed changes for the 2021 school quality report that focused on advancing equity in part by beginning to include the percentage of IEPs who were fully partially or not receiving their IEP recommended special education programs and, and services. The proposed changes will support our school communities and field and central offices to provide improve to improve teaching and learning practices. With the return of full, per, full in-person learning this year, the results so far validate our strategy. Citywide, as schools are, our schools are delivering special education programs at the highest rate ever for this point in the school year. As of mid-November, 82% of our students were reported fully served and 96.6% .6 of the students citywide are at least partially served. Those positive numbers were achieved even with staffing challenges early this school year through sustained work to support schools to program more efficiently, earlier and more thoroughly. Superintendents and BCO teams that support them have worked tirelessly to address the shortfalls in the provision of services throughout the city. I also wanna highlight other critical and ongoing work on behalf of our students with IEPs and their families. Alongside our recovery efforts, we continue to expand training and program offerings in several key areas. 
As we did in school year 2021, we, we are offering extended eligibility for students who have turned 21, but are in the need of continued education or support services in order to graduate with a diploma or transition to adult programs and services. This applies not only to students attending DOE schools, but also for students attending charter schools or placed by DOE in state approved non-public schools. We continue to provide these extended services across the city. In addition, students with IEPs who have completed school but still need to be connected with post-secondary services are receiving transition support consultancy services through our borough-based transition college and college access centers or the District 75 Office of Transition Services and Post-Secondary Planning Initiatives. As part of our focus on literacy, we are continuing to fund our IEP teacher positions in 960 schools who are trained in research-based literacy interventions. We have also developed and launched an intensive reading education and development program, early literacy program, which is a reduced sized ICT class that provides in-depth structured reading interventions to students with and without IEPs. Each iRead classroom has, a, has both a general education teacher and a special education teacher who provide daily instruction with a focus, with a focus on organized reading interventions in all subject areas. A master or lead teacher with special ex expertise in literacy intervention supports those teachers with planning and also works directly with the students in the classroom. The small class size and extra adult support enables teachers to adapt instruction to meet the needs of all learners with a focus on improving students' literacy, language, and speech skills. We, are also, we have also expanded our ASD Nest and ASD Horizon program, adding 40 new sections this school year. These programs serve students with autism spectrum disorder through acclaimed specialized program models in 96 schools citywide. We have made major strides in enhancing our portfolio of special education services for our preschool students, as well as supporting their parents through the process of transition from early inter intervention, evaluation, IEP development, and placement. The city's substantial new investments in preschool special education include bringing preschool special education programs 4410s and 40, 4201s into 3K and pre-K by issuing a contract enhancement. This will give 4410 providers financial support to raise teacher salaries and special class seats in areas of need. We will also add services to 4410s so that preschool students with disabil disabilities get the same 3K and pre-K program support and oversight as the rest of the city. Centralizing enrollment for preschool special education programs, will, which will ensure students are placed in seats they need efficiently while promoting consistency and equity in the placement process. In addition, we are implementing a number of initiatives to support access to inclusive settings and serve more students with disabilities in less restrictive environments. We are doubling the size of our early intervention transition team. The early intervention transition coordinators provide direct support to families as their children age out of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene EI programs and enter the Department of Education. Finally, as part of the DOE's ongoing commitment to ensure that students have timely access to educational program supports, the DOE has increased the number of CPSC administrators and community coordinators at these committees of preschool special education, which allow us to under expand our reach to more families. Family engagement is, a, is critically important to everything related to our students with disabilities, and we continue to develop resources to empower our families. We have made significant investments in expanding our family empowerment efforts, including our Beyond Access series of webinars. The Beyond Access series provides families with the opportunity to learn directly from special education subject matter experts. So far this year, we have hosted sessions for thousands of families on special education recovery service, academic screeners, at-home sensory strategies, and many other topics. We will continue to provide these critical learning opportunities for families on Tuesday evenings at 7.30 throughout the school year. Families can access past sessions on the DOE website with captions available in 35 languages. We recognize that we are only at the beginning of our recovery process and not the end. Special education recovery services will be one of our most important ongoing priorities, which we will adjust and refine as we learn more about the students' needs and their responses to these services. 
My team and I remain committed to eliminating the detrimental effects of the pandemic's disruption on our students' development, however long that may take, while meeting their individual needs on an ongoing basis. We welcome the partnership of this committee in pursuit of those goals. I really wanna thank you, Chair Traeger, and so many members of this committee for your advocacy on behalf of our stu all students and particularly on behalf of our students with disabilities. As I've described, we have seen clear benefits from our students and families from the engagement of this committee. And I look forward to our continued partnership in the next year and beyond. I'm now happy to address any questions that you may have. Thank you, Christina. Um, before we turn to questions, we will actually hear from Council Member Rivera to give opening remarks for the pre-considered resolution being heard today. Uh, Council Member Rivera, whenever you're ready, you can begin. Thank you to the committee staff and of course the Chair Traeger for your guidance and your outstanding leadership on all issues related to education. So I, I want to thank of course the administration for being here and for providing testimony. I'm going to speak a little to as uh, a little on remote learning and really proud to join my colleagues today in introducing a resolution calling upon the New York State Legislature to uh, require any public school located in a city with a population of 1 million or more to provide a remote learning option when community transmission of COVID-19 is at a substantial or high level. As chair of the Committee on Hospitals, I know how disproportionate transmission rates and vaccine inequity has impacted many Black and Latino communities like the one I grew up in. And while I'm deeply proud of the work that we have done as a city to build vaccine confidence and dramatically reduce COVID-19 transmissions, we know the pandemic is far from over. And for the past 20 months, families across New York have had to continuously assess the risks they and their families still face from COVID-19, not to mention families in school districts without proper ventilation and mitigation in buildings that needed repair even before March 2020. And in a city of more than 8 million, school districts should not add to the burdens of the families already suffering from immense educational and health disparities. All five boroughs of New York City are still considered high transmission areas by the CDC, meaning they have at least 100 new daily cases per 100,000 residents. In New York City, we saw over 1,800 cases per day in early September when public schools reopened in person. When, transi when transmission rates are high, we know that families have to make impossible choices. This legislation would give parents the option to pursue remote learning, and in a public health crisis, parents deserve that option and our city should be responsible for providing one. I urge my colleagues in the council to support this legislation in Albany that would make our schools in New York City safer, and I do look forward to hearing from the administration as to these options and making them um, available and, of course, implementing them responsibly and appropriately. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember, for your leadership and your partnership on, on this important resolution and the important message that we're sending to the DOE and to the public uh, that we stand by our kids and their families. Thank you very much. Um, I want to just acknowledge the uh, many members who, are, who have joined us so far. Um, Council Members Lewis, Council uh, Member Riley, Council Member Dinowitz, Council Member Gennaro, Council Member Feliz, Council Member Barron, Council Member Drum, Council Member Brennan. Council Member uh, Rivera, um, and I will, and if I missed anyone, uh, folks could just uh, message me, I will make sure that we get them as part of the record. Um, I, I just, before I get into the questions, and I, I, I wanna say this, this publicly, I, and this is not a reflection of Christina Foti because I, I found her to be incredibly responsive, accessible, gets back to me, my office very quickly on issues and things we raise. And even Kevin Moran, uh, I have to give a, give a thanks as far as uh, his responsiveness to many issues that, that I've raised. But we are failing here. There's no way to sugarcoat this. There's no way to make this sound pretty, make this sound nice. We're failing. Um, and this is time that these kids will never get back. Um, I, I'm going to get into my questions now, but I think we need to set that tone very clearly uh, because we have thousands of children who now have not received mandated critical services, which they're entitled to, which they need, first of all, 
not just about legal obligation. We have a moral obligation. You know, they, they will never get this time back. As a former teacher, if my student missed a day or two of instruction, that was a lot. We're talking now about over a year and a half more of interrupted or missing instruction services for these kids. That is a crisis. There's just, there's no fancy, pretty way of putting it. That is a crisis. We failed. And we, we, and there's a sense of urgency that I think is missing in this conversation with the administration. Um, I'm going to get to questions now. On, on November 9th, uh, it was reported the special education academic recovery program uh, scheduled to begin um, as uh, late as December 6th for the highest need students in all city run schools, the city officials had stated. Um, that's less than three weeks before winter break starts on December 24th and nearly three months into the school year. The program was originally slated to begin. Uh, in October or early November, and then push back to November 15th. Please explain how we arrived here. Why are students with IEPs, once again, quite frankly, getting the shaft from City Hall? And again, I hold the top accountable. I hold the top accountable. This is not a reflection of, of Ms. Foti. The buck stops at the top. Uh, irrespective of federal COVID relief funds, this is the one of the richest cities in the country. Uh, in fact, richer than most states too. Why was planning for this not uh, begun last year? Um, and why are we here? Ms. Foti, explain to me, please. How did we get here? Thank you. Of course, Chair. Um, Chair, we, we certainly share your sense of urgency and uh, you, there's no one that wants, uh, other than our families, there's no one that, that wants this more than, than we do to happen for every one of our students as quickly as possible. Um, we agree, of course, that recovery services are an extremely valuable part of resource to our students. Um, and to be clear, many of our schools have already begun offering these services. Some schools did request additional time uh, for planning and the development of, of, of those plans with families. As we did um, during the pandemic with our individual, with our um, plans that we made for our students during the pandemic and blended learning, um, we learned that those conversations with families are integral. And during the pandemic, we heard inconsistent, we, we heard that feedback from families that um, contact was inconsistent in the development of these remote learning plans. So one of the things that we are really closely monitoring and taking the time to do in this process is ensuring that we make successful um, and timely and thoughtful outreach to our families and to develop individual recovery plans that are gonna most benefit our students. And we are trying to set up these services in the right way, in a meaningful way, in a joyful way that will invite students into the program um, and serve them well. And it's something that they could be, look forward to doing. Um, when schools reported that they needed more time uh, to develop students, some schools needed more time to develop these uh, programs. Uh, we made slight modifications to the timeline. However, we always said that services were intended to start between November and January, and we are committed to ensuring that students start these services on a rolling basis. Uh, Ms. Foti, how many schools have begun the recovery program? We expect uh, the vast majority of schools to start by the end of the month um, with, uh, we are ensuring that all schools start by 12-6, um, but we have already re made outreach to 90,000 families um, and we'll continue to make that outreach until we get to every one of our 183,000 students of I with IEPs. Um, but we expect the vast majority of programs to be up and running by the end of the month. So. Ms. Forte, I, I appreciate that, but I don't think it answered my question. How many schools are currently uh, have started the recovery program? We can definitely follow up, Chair, with the, the exact number of, of schools that have started as of today. Um, but we are closely you know, monitoring and following up with schools to make sure that we're able to um, confirm that schools have started by our 12-6 deadline. Ms. Ms. Fo Ms. Fodi, our 
is does the DOE is does DOE not know how many schools have started the recovery program? No, we certainly we certainly are keeping tabs on this chair, and I'd be happy to send you the updated number from today after the hearing. So just to be clear, the administration today is refusing to disclose how many schools have started the recovery program. Is that correct? I certainly am not trying to refuse um, anything. I want to be as transparent as possible, Chair, with you. Um, Ms. Bochy, uh, you're not being transparent and respectfully. It's a simple question. How many schools have started the recovery program? I'm happy to follow up with you after afterwards um, and, and get you that number. And if I could get it to you during the hearing, I will provide it during the hearing. Um, and as a follow up to that, how many students in total? Uh, you, you just gave a number, 183,000 kids with IEPs. Is that correct, mm -hmm. citywide? Yes, Chair. And, and that's a drop from, we used to have over 200,000, is that correct? It's 183,000 school-aged children. Okay. Um, and do you have data with you now uh, about how many kids, students, are currently being uh, serviced uh, in the recovery program? I, I don't have that data with me right now, Chair, but we are, are going to be following up with that as well. Here's... But, but there's a here, pattern here developing, Ms. Fodi, where... When, the when we asked for basic attendance data at the beginning of the school year, the administration also willfully chose to ignore um, our basic question or basic request of, of information. Uh, this is a pattern. This is not the first time that the administration comes unprepared to a hearing on special education, refusing to tell us how many schools have started this critical program? How many kids are being served? These are not gotcha questions. These are basic questions that should be expected at a hearing on special education services. So sure. I, I respectfully ask, can the DOE give us more information on this now? Yes. Chair, here's, here's what I'm able to share in this moment. And I, and I in no way, am trying to uh, uh, blur or create an unclear response. I'm going to share what I'm able to share, and uh, whatever we're able to share after the hearing, I will, we will certainly share. Our top priority, to be clear, is to get these services in place in every one of our schools. We have sent out a survey to our schools asking them about their readiness to deliver these services. Of our six, approximately 1,600 schools, 1,573 schools have responded. We are actively following up with the 11 schools that we have not heard from. The vast majority of our schools plan to provide these services in a blended format. And the vast majority of our schools have indicated that they are gonna begin the services by the end of the month. As I mentioned, um, we are in the process of developing plans for every one of our students with IEPs. While we have 183,000 students we've already seen actively 100,000 plans developed uh, in, or in the process of being developed for our students with disabilities. So we're all over halfway through. Um, now the parent outreach, even if, if folks are in the system developing these programs, these plans, the, you know, absolutely one of the most critical parts of this is the outreach to families. And so we are gonna to continue to make the outreach to families and those plans are not gonna be finalized until all attempts have been made to, have a, to contact and have a meaningful conversation with our families. That is the picture that I'm able to give of where we are in the process. And I'm really happy to follow up on any additional information, Chair. But Ms. Foti, how are we supposed to uh... Think about the message we're sending to families right now. How are we supposed to target support outreach if we don't even know which schools are starting this program or not? We don't know how many, we don't know who started, who needs more help, support, the reasons why they haven't started. What message are you sending to parents and families right now? Uh, this is not a message of confidence. Um, uh, can you share with me 
Um, what are reasons that you're hearing and your office is hearing? Why schools are having difficulty uh, starting up this program? I mean, I, I'm hearing things, but you're, you're the administration. I, I'd like to hear from you, please. Can we unmute Ms. Foti, please? Thank you. Yes, Chair, we, we, our goal in these recovery services is to provide, one of our goals is to provide as much consistency for our students as possible. And as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, staffing has uh, been a challenge that we are continuing to uh, move mountains on. Um, and, and really, I, I would say, you know, this is consistent with what we're seeing nationally. Um, and the DOE has made heroic efforts to get the staff in place uh, that are gonna be um, trained by us, supported by us. They are our UFT partners that uh, we know so well and that our students know and trust and our families know and trust. And so staffing, as you mentioned at the beginning of this is, is probably the, the, what we're hearing most often from our schools. And yet we are making huge uh, we've hired a, in a very large amount of, of teachers, which Lauren can, can give us more numbers on. Um, and as I mentioned in my testimony, hundreds of related service providers have already been hired this year. Uh, and we've made a year over year investment in our related service providers so that we have a network and, and cohort of uh, folks that we've trained that can provide um, high quality supports to our students. Um, and quite frankly, they're the people that our kids know and they love and who uh, really got our students and our families through, through the pandemic. Um, and our, our kids are delighted to be back in school with them. So Ms. Fortier, you mentioned staffing is a major issue in terms of why programs have been having difficulties uh, starting, is that correct? That I think that is, you know, again, it's, I think this has been, we've seen this across, across the country. Um, but I also think that- well, we're New uh, York. We, we are, we are New York. Uh, the mayor yes, goes yeah. on TV every morning and says, we're, we're New Yorkers. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I need to, I need to kind of dig deeper on this because, sure. you know, the mayor does not talk about this issue uh, on TV, unlike other things. Um, and so I'm just curious uh, to know, and I think that Ms. Uh, Lauren Siciliano is on the is on the is on the hearing here as well. Um, do we have a number of how many pending uh, uh, applications uh, for paras we have in the system now? Uh, these are nomination letters sent by principals uh, to to get folks hired uh, for their schools. Because again, I continue to hear that uh, there is a shortage of power professionals in our schools. Principals have sent uh, paperwork into the DOE weeks ago, if not months ago. So many folks still have not been hired. Uh, so do you have a number of how many pending applications, nominations that are still sitting within DOE? Yes, thank you for the question, Chair Traeger. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, we are so grateful to all of our staff for their their dedication and their service and we know how important uh, all of the staff who support our students with special education have been and just going above and beyond to support our students and families so for paraprofessionals um, i am very pleased to share that we have since the start of the school year more than doubled the size of the substitute paraprofessional pool we now have about 11,000 substitute paraprofessionals in the pool uh, we've more than doubled the number uh, since the start of the school year. Um, and we are continuing to grow that pool on a rolling basis. As you mentioned, nominations come into us and we are escalating all of those. We are um, expediting, I should say, all of those nominations, um, including sharing information with principals around exactly where a nomination is in the process. Um, there are steps that are uh, within DOE's control. And there are many steps uh, where the applicant needs to take an action, such as completing the application. But we are expediting all of these nominations, uh, including waiving fingerprinting fees, um, while still, of course, doing the, the rigorous background check that's needed. 
But uh, Mrs. Siciliano, uh, just again, a substitute can refuse to come into a school. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Substitutes, um, it, it is it is a, a mutual consent for them to show up at the school. Um, but just a reminder on paraprofessionals, before you can be hired as a full-time para, you need to have served as a sub for 25 days. So in order to uh, hire those substitutes full-time, to hire them as full-time paraprofessionals, they need to first serve as substitutes for 25 days. Right. So, and you mentioned you have 11,000 or so in the pool. How many do you have pending? Um, pending, those nominations come in on a daily basis in real time. Um, and many of them are, you know, there are a range of steps in the process. We're expediting the ones that, that DOE can expedite. Um, can you just give me a rough course, number? Just how many are pending right now? Um, I, I don't have that information on hand. I'm happy to look into it to uh, to make sure we can share the data in a meaningful way. Um, but what I can say is that we've more than doubled the size of the pool um, and added 6,000 uh, substitute paraprofessionals this school year alone. Right, um, because I'm still hearing from principals that they're waiting for a significant sizable number of paraprofessionals to get hired. And so I, there continues to be, uh, I think, a disconnect here. I want to just go uh, back to Ms. Foti. Um, we understand that the DOE has split students with IEPs into three priority groups with staggered timelines for launching the recovery services. Uh, please describe those three priority groups um, and how many students are, are in each. Um, what is the percentage within each group of the total population of eligible students? And what is the timeline for launching recovery services for each group? Course. And Chair, I want to circle back to, to the number. We pulled, we pulled the number, and I just want to be incredibly clear that it is super important to me and everyone on this, on this, in this meeting that we provide you the information you're asking us for, and we do so in a transparent way. And I, I just want to be really, really clear about that. Um, we pulled the, the, the most recent report, and 500 of our schools have started. Um, and the rest of the, the vast majority of them on the survey have, in, have indicated that they will be starting um, by the end of the month. Regarding the individual student number, I know that's something you're interested in and that's something I'm gonna have to get back to you on, but this is the information I have today. I wanna um, answer your question about priority groups as well. Um, so within our priority groups, recognizing that this is a Herculean task for our schools um, and it is a new task, right? Uh, and one that we're really, um, grateful to, be, to have the resources to be able to do. We centrally pulled data on the number of, uh, on children that um, showed little to no progress uh, with regard to their IEP goals. And as you know so well, Chair, uh, our IEP goals are the driver of instruction for our students with IEPs. And so if a student showed little to no progress uh, was made during the pandemic, um, then we pulled that student and I identified that student for the school and we sent individualized school level reports to every principal saying that these students, we need to start with, these students are priority group one and you schools know these students and their families know them better than anyone. Please tell us if there is something, um, if we're right here that we see that there's been little to no progress or is there an update that's need to be made? Um, does this child be belong in priority group one? And we then sent a second batch of, of data, a second report for priority group two, which outlined students, as I said in my testimony, that had any, um, any red flag situation that, that could have um, been of concern. For example, um, was a student in temporary housing? Did they have an attendance rate that was less than 90%? Are they a bilingual special education student? Um, did they have a special education teacher in place? Uh, these are all considerations that we um, put into group two um, and priority group two. And then we sent that report to our schools and said, schools, feel free to prioritize or make adjustments to uh, this based on what you know and what you see about these children. But we're seeing this centrally as, as being reflective of, of great need. And then in priority group three is all of our kindergarteners and um, and any and really uh, everyone else to get us to 100%. And all these, although these priority groups um, 
you know, are, are groups that we've identified and asked schools to make decisions about and, and given them a roadmap as to where we think schools should start. The goal here is 100% and every child is included um, in, in, this, um, in this initiative. We just ask schools to start with our services for our students with the most urgent needs based on what we're seeing and ask schools to um, figure out based on that data. If they agree with if, that report and if so, please start those students uh, as soon as possible so that they can begin receiving these additional recovery services. So I, I appreciate that uh, answer, Ms. Foti. And you, you mentioned, uh, according to your latest data, 500 schools have begun the, the program. Is that correct? Yes, Chair. And do, are you keeping tabs on are all of these programs, uh, these 500 schools, are they in person? Are they remote? Are they, can you, do you have some data on that? Yeah, the, we are keeping tabs on that. Um, and the vast majority of our programs are gonna be blended. So uh, in, in person part-time and remotely for supplemental services. Um, and I'll ask my team to see if, if we have the, that number for the 500 that I just cited. Um, but everything we're seeing uh, points in the direction of, of most often schools are choosing to implement a blended approach to these services. Does someone from your team want to follow up on that, uh, or they—they they are they are they are pulling. I think they're looking at it now, folks, um, in terms of exact number. But um, it's either the vast majority of the schools are blended or in person. Um, and if, if folks can find the number of remote, if pulled the number of remote, uh, I will certainly share that with you as soon as possible. And are, are you keeping track at central level of which students actually? receive recovery services and which services they receive, not just what the plans say, but actual receipt of services? Yes, Chair. We're gonna be tracking that through STARS for the uh, uh, instructional component of this. So for students receiving interventions, we're gonna track that in STARS. And we're gonna be tracking um, the receipt of related services through recovery, recovery related services uh, in our encounter attendance system. Uh, have they begun entering that any information into STARS? They have, sir. And they, I, yes, they have. And in terms of uh, that information, I don't have that today. Because I was just going to ask how many kids have been entered into STARS. That can give us some indication of how many kids are beginning to get these services. Do you, you, don't, do you have that information with you, Christina? No, not today, sir. Um, I have just... Uh, couple here, and then I want to turn to busing very quickly, and then turn to my colleagues. Um, the committee uh, has heard directly from parents and advocates on how little information they have received from the DOE with respect to what specific recovery services will be provided and key details about, about transportation. Every single hearing we've had during the pandemic, we have heard over and over from the DOE that communication will be better moving forward. And yet, here we are again, in many of the, in the same position. Um, why do we continue to hear from families that they are not getting this information about what specific services are being offered and on the issue of uh, transportation? Sure, uh, I'll, I'll begin with the communication and then I'll, I'll hand it to my colleague, Kevin Moran for transportation. Um, in September, we sent out a message in NICSA in uh, the student's home language. Um, a letter indicating that there, that uh, a child or a student is entitled to recovery services. And in that um, letter, we indicated that they, families could certainly reach out to schools, but, but that families, that, that that outreach wasn't necessarily on the family, that schools, we, we would be asking schools to reach out to families to discuss these services. And um, as I mentioned, Chair, we are conducting that outreach, or outreach to families. Um, and given the individualized nature of this, um, both on the student level and on the school level, uh, we think it's important that the teachers and schools have the time to have a meaningful conversation. And as a result, we've carved out time um, for every, every teacher or provider making the call to a family. Um, we've ensured that we've negotiated with the UFT um, two hours of time so that uh, the, these plans can be thoughtfully 
constructed and that um, families meaningfully contacted um, and that there could be a real conversation about what's going to work for the child and what's not going to work and what's going to work for the family. And with regard to busing, I, I hand it over to my colleague, Kevin Moran. Hello, uh, committee, and thank you, Chair Traeger. Uh, at the top of this, I'd like to start by thanking you and the, and the council at large uh, for the passage of Local Law 32, 33, and 34 in 2018. As you may remember, I joined the effort after 20 years of education to support transportation, and those local laws help bring about transparency and a roadmap for student busing uh, going forward. Um, delighted to hear, you know, to say that here today we're doing very much um, what we set out to do in our modernization and bringing on uh, our VIA GPS project, which will be rolling out throughout this year, and ultimately all the public reporting that that parents and schools uh, deserve. Additionally, this year and it was years in the in the working, and just very recently, we have now changed uh, the way we service schools and communities in, in creating a city affiliated not for profit entitled Nice Bus to learn lessons about the bus industry and how to better serve families. And so, from a transportation uh, aspect this fall, we very much focused on service improvements and, and certainly with special education reducing time traveled. I just want to give an over the top how we are doing on transportation as it relates to this school year. Um, we service 116,571 general education students uh, and 49,590 IEP students. On those routes, it's 5,740 routes for special education and 2,433 routes for general education. So we have 8,173 routes running currently, and we're very much excited to be a part of the recovery program. I think the extended uh, registration deadline to 12-6 gives schools and families the opportunity to, to, to prescribe the, the most appropriate service delivery model for families. And we're very much excited to have in-person uh, as an available option once we get the data and register and create the route. And we'll be in contact with schools and families um, as soon as possible. And just uh, Chair Traeger, as you know, as a former self-contained classroom teacher and supervisor and after, uh, supervisor of an after school program, I know how valuable this is for students and families as the husband to a District 75 guidance counselor. These are not conversations I have just professionally. I have this personal and professional commitment to our, all our students. And as a father of two students in a public school system, I take my job very seriously. I hold my team and myself uh, to the highest levels of accountability. We will be delivering service for students and families they deserve uh, and all things that are necessary to participate in the recovery program. So more to come from us on deadlines, but on 12-6, we take a snapshot of the data, who needs to participate when, we'll create routes and get back to schools and families as fast as possible. Thank you. Uh, so, so, so Kevin, just to follow up on that, and I again want to say for the record that I have found Kevin Moran to be a very responsive to my office, um, full hours of the day, quite frankly. Um, and this is not, again, a reflection on him personally, but this is an area where we have a lot of work to do. And I think Kevin would agree that there's a lot more work to do on, 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 transport, on transportation. Kevin, if you could help clarify for the record, because there were folks, families who heard uh, at a recent meeting that there would not be transportation provided in terms of the recovery programs and so forth. Can you clarify that on the record about what will there be transportation services? What will that look like and when will it start? Yeah, yes, there will be transportation services provided. We followed up on that. We, we kept the transcript of the meeting and kind of clarified kind of what, potentially where the disconnect was. For us, what we're gonna do, as I mentioned, for routing, we are currently, as I mentioned, running over 8,000 routes. So when a school dismisses at three o'clock, we're gonna have to set another set of routes for 5.30. We're taking that data snapshot on the 6th of December. We'll take that data set and then get it to our routing team. Once we produce those routes, we'll be offering it to our companies, ultimately then informing families when it will start. So uh, I don't wanna give you a firm de deadline, but what I'd like to do is circle back with you post 12-6, because then I can look at scale and scope and then give a more realistic estimate about when it can start, but in earnest and as soon as possible. So that information kind of almost uh, confl conflicts sort of with what Ms. Foti said just before, just maybe help clarify for me. Ms. Foti, uh, uh, just clarify for me, you had mentioned that you're hoping to get the rest of the schools up and running by the uh, end of this month. Was that correct? Yes, the schools are 
schools are going to, are, are going to begin uh, serving students in whatever form they can begin serving students. And so we uh, are going to work with Kevin and team to make alternative transportation uh, available uh, in, in a way that best su supports the family. Um, it may not be uh, busing, but we are certainly able to, to do Metro cards. Um, we are also uh, providing a remote option for families that would like to take us up on, on that offer as well um, for recovery services while busing gets in place. Um, but we are gonna try um, to make, and, and this is why the individual uh, conversations with families is so important. Um, we need to figure out what they need in order to make recovery services work and are gonna be working individually with families to uh, sort out uh, the logistics of, of what that particular family needs. Yeah, and, and, I, and if I could add, uh, Chair Traeger, we're gonna meet the schools and families where they are. There are instances um, where school buses arrive early to schools and we could do things on morning program if schools have accepted that as a mode of uh, service delivery, doing morning service that had come up in the earlier conversation you'd reference around what does morning service look like. So we won't rule that out. What we wanna do is say, look, if there's time and space where buses can get there a little earlier and staff will be in place earlier, we'll absolutely participate in that. And then we'll continue this through the, the registration process of where schools are. We wanna take one clean data shot right now of who is participating and then do the city overlay for the, for the routing for the city of New York. So, so on the sixth, we begin in earnest for, for the busing snapshots. Anything before then, we'll work with schools and families on options that are available to best support. Right, but Ms. Modi, if, if the IEP states that transportation, that, that, they, that they need transportation, this is a program really designed for children with special needs to make sure that we account for the impact that this has had on them. Um, what we just heard from Kevin Moran is that in many cases, there will not be bus service available for these kids by the end of the month when you're expecting schools to get uh, this underway. Is that, I'm, I'm talking about bus service. Yeah. Chair, it, this is, um, you know, ideally, of course, we'd want to be saying, Absolutely, services are, are fully in, in place. Again, from the start of this, uh, we have always said that services would be, begin between November and January uh, for our students. And while we share the urgency for this to begin as soon as Ms. possible. Foti, but Ms. Foti, respectfully, that is not when school began for kids. Um, and I also have to say, and I'm not saying you or Kevin, but I also have to say that there has been mixed signals from this administration when others have pressed the issue, whether there's a, a bus driver shortage, whether there's a, issues with companies, folks at the top have been trying to sugarcoat this, but clearly we have a problem here. Um, and I am concerned, we just, we just learned that the majority of schools have not started uh, the, the, the recovery program. We still don't have a number of how many kids are currently uh, being serviced by this program. And now we're hearing that bus transportation is gonna extend likely. And Kevin, based on my history, if you get the information by early December, the way it works in August for regular school year, it takes a couple of weeks, things to process, routes to develop, they do test runs and so forth. So realistically, when will these routes begin, January? Yeah, I, I hear I hear what you're saying. I think in fairness to the program and the, the service delivery model in terms of assessing students' progress where they are and working with schools on individual plans, and the fact that we at the moment said schools need more time to plan, and therefore we moved the deadline out and introduced various models by which the service could be delivered, albeit a remote setting within the school day. But this allowed opportunities for further discussions. And so this was to get it right for schools and families. This is based upon feedback from the field, from principals and families about, listen, I need more options available to me. And so the deadline was sent. And so we actually have a deadline of 12-6. It's been clear. And to Christina's point, we've said November, you know, that we begin process November, December, January. These programs will be going throughout the year. Um, on an iterative process in, in phases and in tiers. And so we're ready now with multiple modalities to deliver this service, one being in person until 5.30. We'll take that snapshot, as I promised you, on, this, on the 12-6 deadline. We'll do this as fast as we can for kids and families. And there's also other options. We'll work with schools and families to give them in the meantime, if they want to join uh, the service in a non-remote, in-person fashion after school. And, and I do want to address one thing you mentioned about driver shortages. Uh, we are running 
8,173 routes per day. On any given moment, we could see absences attributed to regular, uh, a typical sickness. We could see a retirement. We could see a COVID quarantine. We are currently only seeing 560 routes in a scenario by which a school bus company had to, had to either double up the route or put a substitute on. As you know, every bus company carries a 10% substitute rate. We do not want substitutes necessary as this solution here. We've used it um, to get us by, but we are absolutely running at, at full capacity, delivering for our students and families. Um, school bus company drivers have put on 300, nearly 300 new drivers since September. So we work with them, uh, certainly would like to do more. Uh, reduced travel time is our focus. Alternate 3 p.m. stop, which is very popular uh, from our feedback from the CCE, uh, CCSE meetings. So we like to do things like that. But our full focus now is on recovery. Once we get that data, you have my commitment to a meeting post 12-6. I can give you the data snapshot. Who would like evening in-person person service, how many routes would that be? What would that timeline be like? Once I have that data, I will sincerely give you a, a concrete deadline. And Kevin, will bus service be provided for students in temporary housing and children uh, in, in foster care? We, we absolutely, right now we're busing uh, 564 students that reside within a DHS, DHS shelter, uh, 1,361 that reside in a non-DHS shelter. I have spoken well, with Commissioner Banks in the beginning of the year, we've had no escalations or no problems serving students in temporary housing. So that effort will continue. Students but to be clear, uh, yeah. Kevin, to be clear, kids uh, who are in temporary housing or foster care without IEPs, so I'll look at that. I'll see where that number, if that number exists and who needs that support, but absolutely any IEP. That number exists, stress? Kevin. Yeah, I, well, I wanna know the students participate in the program. So to be fair, mm -hmm. I haven't seen that yet. What I can tell you now is every IEP mandated kid gets that service. Every kid K to six gets that service. If you're asking if I could do after school for a non-IEP student that gets a bus at three, could they get it at 5.30? That's a data set I'll get back to, absolutely. Um, I have some additional items, but uh, I know some of my colleagues have been very patient and I want to turn to them. Uh, also just note that we have been joined by council member uh, Rose and council member Ampre Samuel. And I'll turn to the moderator. Um, I don't know if, if uh, council member Riley, I, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you, Chair Traeger. Um, council member Riley, you can begin after Councilmember Riley, we will go on to Councilmember Dinowitz. I'd also just quickly like to remind all the council members now is the time to use the hand raise function if you do have questions. Thank you, um, Councilmember Riley. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Council. Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger, for your continuous uh, advocacy for our students um, in New York City. Um, I've been in and out of different um, Zoom meetings this morning, so I apologize if I'm going to ask a question that was already answered. Um, but to talk about some of our, our uh, students who are in special needs or who have IEPs, um, I did hear uh, uh, Kevin speak about some of the programming um, that you guys have, like after school programs or things of that nature for um, these students. I have many uh, parents in my district who are, aren't cognizant of these programs. Um, I just want to kind of know the marketing. How do you let the parents know about the programs and what kind of programs do you actually offer? And for the record, uh, because I do it every uh, education hearing, I, I'm going to strongly advocate for remote learning again uh, because uh, we have a lot of uh, parents in our community who are dying in need of remote learning because they still do not feel safe uh, bringing their students back to school. Uh, so I just wanted to put that uh, plug out there. but. Uh, I just want to kind of focus on the program and what programs are out there, what marketing are done to parents um, to enforce these programs. Um, and if we could do anything to the can um, in the council to, you know, uh, extend these programs or make more programs, because we do have a lot of uh, students within our community, scholars within our communities who could benefit from these. Thank you. Council Member Riley, it's always so nice to see you. And um, I always, we always appreciate the spirit of partnership you always show up in, so thank you. Um, we are actually in the process of working with FACE to develop marketing materials for recovery services. Um, and as soon as we have those ready, Council Member will share them with all, all of you so that you could uh, help us get the word out and um, have that information on hand for you and your staff as well. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Um, and and please, if you if you definitely uh need any uh 
assistance with the marketing on how to kind of get it out there, please uh, contact us. Uh, we we know how to get this message out to our constituents, our neighbors. So I think it's very imperative because every time I go to a school, I'm again approached by a parent who aren't aware of these programming. So if there's any way we could kind of help out and collaborate together, uh, please do. And I, I just want to shout out one of my constituents who I see here, um, Brother Thomas Shepard, um, who's also a parent advocate and does a lot for our communities. Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger. Um, and, and thank you to the DOE for your testimony. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Councilman Riley. Next, we'll hear from Councilman Rodinowitz. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Chair Traeger, for you know having this hearing and for your advocacy, and to the DOE for uh, the work you've done to create vaccine sites, and that you'll be coming back to the schools in a few weeks to administer their second shot. Uh, I know that's a big undertaking, but it's vital that we get um, all of our kids vaccinated. Um, I also, before I get started with my questions, want to echo Councilmember Riley's sentiments um, that if there's any help my office can do or we can do in ensuring our parents and our families know about programs available to them, I want to make sure you know we, we have working partners in this council office and many other council offices. It's vital that our children uh, get what they need. Um, so as is, you know, as everyone knows, for over a year, our students missed out on in-person academic learning social emotional learning and as students return uh, students are still bringing the scars of, of the lockdown or the fear of bringing COVID home to their grandparents of contracting COVID um, have you seen have we seen an increase in the number of IEP referrals or number of services required as IEPs are amended as a result of students being home for so long um, or facing those emotional needs For this one, I'm going to invite my colleague, John Hammer, to talk about uh, increase, uh, referral rates and uh, evaluations, which are, of course, critical to the IEP process. Council Member Dinowitz, thanks so much for the question. And uh, uh, Christina, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, you know, uh, all of the academic recovery efforts and in particular special education uh, recovery services program that we're speaking about today is very much uh, designed to provide the additional um, specialized instruction and services to allow students to continue to, to uh, thrive um, in, you know, in their return to, to learning this year. Um, so, absolutely, our, our evaluation processes remain intact. Uh, we are seeing our initial uh, and reevaluation rates uh, become more in line to pre-pandemic -pre numbers uh, to, to your specific question um, and, and have increased, um, you know, beyond where we were during the pandemic uh, last school year. So the, so the referral rates have increased? From, from, from uh, you know, blended and remote learning last year, they have, right. they have I mean, increased. predictably, the right? It, exactly. Do you know by, by how much? They've increased. They've come. They've come more in line to pre pre pandemic uh, numbers. Not quite exactly where we were pre pandemic, but over the first couple of months, uh, we are we are pretty much aligned to to where we were pre pandemic. And, and have you seen an increase in the number of services required for students who already have IEPs? Uh, I think generally we're seeing uh, services that are recommended uh, aligned to where things were in, in pre-pandemic. I, I, we can look specifically and provide specific numbers on uh, rates to, to special class, and we can definitely look at that and provide that after the hearing. Uh, but generally, students continue to be recommended to receive services in inclusive settings, um, and the supports uh, that are being provided to them uh, okay. you know, will, will meet their needs. Yeah, I, I really uh, you know, value that data. I know it's very easy to get off CSIS, you export mm -hmm. an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so I'm very interested to know and very surprised to, to see that services, although kids, we acknowledge students need more and more, that services uh, aren't increasing in line. Um, but that's, um, but, but I'm interested in seeing that data. Um, I, I want to talk about teachers for a second, because, uh, you know, in order to meet the needs of our children, we need to meet the needs of our teachers. And just to paint a picture, imagine a life as a special education teacher before the pandemic. Uh, I'll take high school because that's what I did. <laughs> you know, we're teaching multiple preps with multiple teachers addressing the needs of the highest need learners in the building, 
dozens of individualized education plans per year, collecting documents, holding meetings. And all of that is in addition to regular staff meetings, regular assignments, like lunch, duty, like tutoring. This is during the day. Now we've added on top of that, teachers conducting uh, the DESA, which is 43 questions, um, the special education recovery service forms, new plans for education plans for students who may have contracted COVID. Um, and, so, and so we're piling more and more on our special education teachers. So one, how many special education teachers have left the system since, since the school year began or since COVID began? Time expired. I uh, certainly, council members, understand all of us understand and appreciate the the job of our special educators, and they are just phenomenal. Um, and we certainly uh, understand uh, and are cognizant of of the workload that has been on them, um, and uh, are doing all that we can to support them, including trying to provide additional time and compensation for the special education related. Um, services that we're asking them to do. Uh, with regard to numbers and staffing, I, I turn it over to Chief Administrative Officer Lauren Siciliano. She's muted if she did. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you for unmuting me. Um, I absolutely echo everything that Christina shared about how important uh, our special educators are. Um, in terms of retirements and resignations, uh, I don't have a special education specific number, but what I can share and, and do know is that retirements and resignations for this school year are largely in line with where they were pre-pandemic, so for the school year immediately prior to the pandemic. We've discussed um, uh, with the council before that last school year we saw uh, overall a reduction in retirements and resignations compared to what had been our norm. We're now in line with uh, pre-pandemic levels. Um, what I uh, will also share is that uh, in the lead up to this school year, we did hire over 5,500 uh, additional teachers and uh, nearly 2,000 of those teachers were uh, special educators. And the 2,000 special educators, was that just filling the gap or is that additional special education teachers above and beyond what it was before? Because as I, as I highlighted the workload especially of our special education teachers is drastically increasing. Yes, it would be a mix of both. Okay, so, so how many additional, sorry, how many additional special education teachers have been hired? The net game. Yeah, no, I, I understand what you're asking. Okay, um, okay. What, I, uh, what I don't know in this moment is, um, I don't have a breakout of the retirements and resignations by title, but um, what I do want to emphasize is, uh, in addition to the 2000, our work doesn't stop there. We continue to hire throughout the year and add to our special education capacity through a few critical programs. Um, one, it, leading up to the start of the school year, we were able to significantly expand our DOE-run alternative certification pipeline programs for teachers that focus on uh, high need areas, including special education. Those programs had dipped to about 500 participants pre-pandemic. And uh, for this school year, we were, able, we were able to more than double that to over a thousand. Um, in addition, DOE um, offers loan forgiveness and subsidized tuition for candidates who um, uh, uh, teacher candidates in these high need titles, as well as for extension or additional certification programs for existing staff to get their special education certificate. Um, and then this fall, we launched an in year teacher pipeline program um, so that uh, qualified candidates are able to enter a teacher education program mid-year to be able to grow that cohort. So uh, I don't want it to seem that the work that we did in uh, leading up to September, that the work stops there. It absolutely does not. We are continuing to expand our special education teacher capacity in order to grow the pool of special education teachers. Okay, just, so just understand from, you know, from what I'm hearing, from teachers and families is, is that these 
uh, numbers. And, and by the way, the programs of, of, of the accelerated um, certifications, loan forgiveness, those are good programs. And I support those as ways to you know, bring more people into the teaching profession. But the numbers you're saying don't reflect the realities that exist as a special education teacher. When more and more is being piled on their plates and it's not being met by more human uh, support. And, uh, you know, I, I, the, the extra time to provide um, that's being provided to teachers, the extra, I guess, compensation being provided to teachers, you know, money's nice, but sanity is better. And I think teachers, especially special education teachers, would deeply appreciate more human support. There's only but so much money you could throw at something, right? We understand the, the money's the, the money's there, but that's not enough. We need to bring more teachers on and reduce the workload because the, again, the numbers you're sharing don't align with what I'm hearing from my schools and my teachers. And it's becoming an unsustainable model. It's not enough to forgive loans for teachers. Yet yeah, the, the, the profession is becoming an undesirable one and an unsustainable one for those in the system. And my, my last question is just about the, the this, um, schools that have done these the, the programs you said 500 schools have begun like these weekend after school programs just when you say begun the programs are those fully staffed programs that are meeting the the needs that are fully staffed that are meeting the needs of all of the students or are those those just 500 programs that have commenced in some capacity that have they are 500 programs that have commenced in some capacity and just want to reiterate that we have always envisioned these services, recognizing everything you just said, council member, about the amount that is on everyone's plate right now, uh, that not everything was going to happen all at once. And hence our priority groups of students of wanting to make sure that services begin for the students that um, need the most support. Uh, and so we've asked for schools to begin those services and then continue to uh, iterative it, in, on a rolling basis, continue to uh, uh, add more students to the program, hire more staff as needed. Um, and as we discussed, uh, students are really um, being looked at now for the intensity and amount of service that they need um, to, and this extra help that these services provide. Okay, thank you. I'll leave with two comments. One is, um, I sure hope you're anticipating um, teacher resignations or teacher burnout. Uh, much that I was hoping you would anticipate all the work that needed to be done, I think in May, when schools were announced um, that that they were reopening, I'm, I'm really hoping that we start planning more in advance um, and that we um, that we recognize that. And also just a little you know verbiage. Um, I, I keep hearing the DOE saying we, we are doing this, we're doing outreach to parents. I just I just hope that that language changes a bit because the reality is that it's not we, it's, it's our teachers and our special education teachers. And I know we're all part of the same team, um, but I, I really hope you'd be more explicit and you know about really recognizing that our teachers are going above and beyond and doing an immense amount of work, so much more than they ever thought they, they, they would for our children. So I, I hope that you all recognize it and reflect that in the words you use. And I'll turn it back to the chair, Traeger. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, council member. And, you know, to kind of to drive the point further about, uh, I, I appreciate the council member questions about the program starting in some capacity versus fully starting. And, and again, many schools have not started in any capacity. Um, this is what we talk about when we talk about equity, you know, the, the mayor and the administration was so focused on just trying to get something open that we did not center this student population that historically, and quite frankly to this day, is still being shortchanged in many ways. Last year, my office with, with colleagues in the council, we issued a proposal report on a phased reopening centering this student population and others because we understood for in-person services, because we understood that certain kids have much greater need than others. But here, the focus again was to go on national TV to say, look, 
the largest school district in, in America is open in person. Everything is great. All good, New York. But to this day, we have thousands of kids. I don't even have the number of kids, but thousands of kids still not receiving critical services, which they're entitled to. That is nothing to be proud of. We have a lot of work to do on that. I have a question about our preschool special education. Um, also, I just want to note that we've been joined by Councilman Rosenthal. Thank you. And uh, we'll, we'll just uh, very quickly, just want to ask this. Um, I see Deputy Chancellor Wallach with us. Um, as part of its recovery plan, the city is using funding to provide an enhanced contract to preschool special education programs to help address critical need. The city's uh, solicitation preview for the enhanced contract notes that the DOE hopes, quote, hopes to create a pathway to higher salaries for staff, but does not make any commitment to salary parity for teachers or staff at preschool special um, education programs. Also, we've been joined by Councilman Borelli, so I note that for the record too. Salary increases took effect for all other uh, childhood, uh, early childhood teachers at DOE contracted programs last month. Why is there no commitment to providing salaries on par with their DOE counterparts to teachers at DOE contracted preschool special education programs who work with young children who have the most intensive needs? And please do not tell me money is the issue we are in receipt of billions and billions of education dollars. I, I look forward to this answer. Thank you, thank you, Chair Traeger and, and, and other members and thanks for, thanks for having us here today. Um, I, I wanna begin just by saying, and I'll get very quickly to the, to the, to the plain answer to your question. Um, we're, we're excited about this solicitation and, and about the investment that we're going to make in, in building the capacity of our partners in preschool special education, namely what we call um, the, the state approved non-public 4410 organizations. Um, and we do plan to build strong, even stronger partnerships with these organizations by bringing them into the sort of 3K and pre-K programs full stop and providing them with the supports that all our programs receive. And as you pointed out, and I'm getting to the answer now, creating a pathway uh, to higher salaries. Um, the, the reason we, we and, and we went through a similar process um, with when we, when we did, when we rebid our, our overall early childhood program, um, we're, we, we will go out with a solicitation. Uh, we will ask programs what it is that they need to, to provide a high quality program. We are, we, in keeping with our process, um, don't make um, uh, commitments ahead of time before we know what they will cost. And we go through a procurement process and I think, so, so that, is the, that is the reason it, it, it is a process related answer, but also a way of ensuring that we're getting um, good, accurate information from all those providers and making our decisions with all that information in hand. That's part of what a, a request for proposals or request for information does. And when we have that information in hand, I think we share the goal of making sure that all of these educators are, are compensated for the incredible work that they do and in a fair and, and equitable way. Um, but as you said, like that is the reason why we're not committing full stop to a certain result ahead of, of a solicitation and a request for information. We are, we're gonna go through that process in a fair way as we did with the rest of the system. So Deputy Chancellor, when I said the pathway, that I'm using DOE's language, that's that, yes. those are not my words. That's right, um, a pathway to higher salaries, correct. Why aren't there higher salaries right now? Um, historically, the answer I've been given is money. That cannot be an excuse anymore because we are in receipt of billions of dollars and quite frankly, much more will be on the way uh, if Congress passes a second round of, of, of aid to New York, which will be for early childhood edu ed education as well, which will free up even more dollars for New York, which, but I'm, I'm not even counting that. We already have billions from Washington, a lot of money from the state. Why isn't there uh, pay parity uh, agreement struck now with 4410 teachers. Yeah, so I, I'll just say that thanks to, to your advocacy and the advocacy of, of, of other members on this call, you know, we moved forward in the, in the last budget um, with an agreement to make this partnership stronger and put resources to it. And we released a concept paper again as a beginning to that process. We feel the same sense of urgency you do um, and our team has been hard at work preparing um, the next step of this process. And we, we, you know, we, we hope to have news on that very, very shortly. 
Um, but the answer is, um, you know, we're we're moving as fast as we can and um, plan to release something soon and then move forward as fast as we can to get the new partnerships in place. And I hope you're right about additional resources because we really do share the goal of making sure that these educators are, are compensated for the, for the work that they're doing in, in a fair way. Yeah, there's, there's money. I mean, there's no denying it, there is money. I'm, I'm on the budget negotiation team. My other colleagues are Councilman Rosenthal as well. There is money, there's, there's just, there really is no excuse at this point uh, to get this done. And again, and, and I know people care about this, but it has to be said, every day a kid missing instruction, that, 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 they can't get that back. And I think the issue here is just better pay for staff, better pay for educators. And I also wanna say with regard to the staffing issues plaguing you know, our K to 12s uh, in terms of the recovery program, I, I, I'll be very blunt about it. Um, is the administration considering increasing pay for educators and staff to work in after school and Saturday programs. I don't, um, but there's one. I mean, Chair, we hear everything you're saying. Uh, I, I, Lauren, I don't know if you wanna jump in here or, um, okay, uh, she needs to be unmuted. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, right now, as, as Christina has outlined, schools are contacting families to understand what services are needed and work with the families to plan out those services. Uh, together with the multiple models that Christina outlined earlier in terms of the different ways that those services can be delivered, um, and that, including the different staffing strategies. So uh, at this point, of course, for work after hours, there is, of course, additional pay that comes from that. Um, and we have, as I said, continued uh, other programs and expanded programs that uh, incentivize additional um, individuals to become teachers and support our students. So uh, the incentives that we have done so far have really been focused on growing our teacher pool and the pool of, of eligible substitutes. Um, and then for uh, the after school services or Saturday services, there is of course additional pay that comes from delivering those services. So but Warren, just to answer my question, mm -hmm. uh, is the administration considering high increasing pay for staff? I know, I know you pay per session. That's not my question. Are you considering increasing pay, which, which staff gets to work so we could address this very severe, serious staffing issue plaguing our schools? I, of course, never want to take anything off the table because all of this changes in real time. Um, that has not been an area of focus so far. And if your other strategies are not working, what am I missing? What is the contingency plan? So right now, the, the, it's not really a contingency plan, but the um, approach that we've taken is to offer these multiple different models that schools can use so that based on uh, the needs of their students and the resources that they have, they can um, best organize to meet those needs. So that's the, the approach that we've taken is to offer multiple different ways that this can be done so that at a local level, the school has the flexibility uh, to implement based on what works best for them. But there are certain kids that require certain services in person. Is that correct? That's correct. And what are we doing when we don't have staff uh, that is licensed in that area to provide that service for them in person? So just, just in terms of the cascade, which uh, I think you know, Chair, but I'll just I'll, I'll share um, so others are aware as well. Um, if there is a particular service where a particular license is needed and that expertise is not available at the school level, um, the school can, from a full-time staffing perspective, then go to the district level, uh, open up the posting there, and then uh, just to take related services as an example, if uh, an occupational therapist is needed, just as an example, um, and there isn't one available in the school or the district, um, we do also then have contracted providers who we work with uh, to deliver that service to make sure that the right staff um, is delivering the service to those students. It sounds to me, Warren, that we're again letting the budget define 
the services our kids receive rather than the budget being shaped by the, the, the needs of our kids. But I would be mindful of my colleagues' time. Councilman Rosenthal, I know you have, you have questions you wanna ask. Time starts now. Thank you so much, Chair Traeger. And actually, I just wanna follow up a little bit on your point and connect it to what Council Member Dinowitz said um, just prior which is the link between salaries and people leaving the system in droves. Um, I don't know if anyone listened to, but I would urge you to listen to a wonderful New York Times uh, daily podcast from yesterday and the day before on the state of education around the country. Um, there are many points you can take away from it, but one is just how impossible it is for teachers and educators. And we have to acknowledge that. And, you know, Deputy Chancellor Wallach and everyone from the DOH who is here right now, you know, this, this whole situation is horrible. It's one horrible thing after another. Uh, I know that you're trying the best you can. But I also know how many students are truly suffering from this. And to pick up on Council Member Traeger's point, I, I love the way you said it. Um, so I'm sort of nervous to say it again, but don't let the budget drive the process. No, don't let the budget drive the outcome. Start with the needs and let the needs drive the outcome. And if DOE, well, you're hamstrung, right? Because OMB is telling you there's no money and OLR is telling you it has to be negotiated. So you're not the ones who really, who should be excoriated here, but, and I don't know how hard you're fighting for it, but the salary parity is a no brainer and has been in the public discussion for at least five years. So saying that five years later, you're now maybe gonna set up a process for maybe getting somewhere, you have been put in an embarrassing situation because I know that you know that uh, without sa salary parity, these nonprofits that provide the services will continue to have a revolving door of teachers who just want to get in to work for DOE and leave to work for DOE. And, it, and who suffers is the child who has four different teachers over the course of the year. Um, so I really like the idea of being much more public about the ramifications of, of the failures here. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess it's not a question, but just to say, you know, you're, you're in an impossible situation defending a system that cannot be defended. Um, I mean, I'm happy for you to respond, but I guess that was a speech. The no, no, I, no, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, 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 go, please. I want to, I, I don't want to take up more, more time. I know it's, I know it's limited. Um, but I, I, I do just want to say, I think, I think that um, this administration and we, as parts of it, have made tremendous strides in, in preschool special education and in building new relationships and partnerships with these organizations. And I really do hear the urgency with which you and the chair are expressing uh, that, you know, addressing this issue is overdue. And again, we share the sense of urgency and are working very hard to get um, a solicitation out the door. That will move yeah. us closer to addressing the issues. And I hear you that yeah, it's been in, in the public domain it, for It doesn't require a solicitation. What do they need? They need better salaries. What do they need? A more comprehensive, you know, staffing model. It's not, no one needs a solicitation to know that. You're waiting to hear back from, you know, nonprofits that have been telling you for three years they're drowning. I mean, uh, you know, you know, spoiler alert, they need more staff and they need higher salaries. So, you know, why not write the solicitation with 
the higher salaries and more robust staffing model. I mean, that's it's just painful to this hearing. I, I it hurts, you know, I, because this is a devastating situation. And if it, OMB understood how devastating it was, they would release the money. Uh, it's just no one can defend the indefensible. It, you know, say, writing an RFT. Time and, expired. Okay, so here's my second question, Chair, that I really meant to be asking about. Um, sorry. Uh, I just, I, uh, we passed local law 2020, which requires DOE to release the first annual report on special education settlement agreements by November 1st, 2020, and the second annual report by November 1st, 2021. So the DOE has not published either report. We don't know um, why or what stage of the process each uh, lawsuit is at. And therefore, um, those with special education kids um, who already have to mortgage their homes to get the money that's due back to them, that amount of time is increasing and the lack of transparency on it is, um, dis is also not, um, you know, I think the whole point of reporting is to get us transparency so everyone can jump in and try to help, right? It's not transparency so you know people can be mad. The point is that where are the hiccups and do we need more staffing? Because again, the consequences of the increase in time are dire for these families. And, and so I do have a question, which is, when do you foresee this report, which was, um, which is a legal obligation on DOE uh, to be um, released to the public? Thank you for the question, council member. Um, we obviously uh, want to meet and, uh, and, and satisfy the, the obligations that we have on this front. Um, unfortunately, um, there, we're, we seem to not be clear on the report that you're re referring to. Um, so if we could get back to you, unless one of my colleagues would like to jump in with more clarification. Oh my goodness, that's a frightening outcome. Uh, I think city council staff has been asking for this repeatedly. So let's, you know, be honest here, but we're talking about mm -hmm. local law 20 of 2020. Um, I, I don't think there can be any confusion on this given how long we negotiated this bill and, um, you know, how much come back and forth conversation. It's very disheartening mm -hmm. to hear that you don't even know. I mean, that tells me that we ain't gonna see this report. And, and this is such a simple transparency bill. It's a transparency bill where all we're asking is what's ever on your dashboard that you can see, because obviously you have to track this stuff, that you make it public. So look, if you don't even know about the bill, then that tells me your lack of interest I, I don't know. No, no don't council know. member, I, I apologize. Let me clarify. I just personally am not involved with the bill. So I was inviting one of my colleagues to clarify. Okay, um, anyone here who can clarify? Um, and so, and me? if they, if they can't, yes. And so I, I'm, I didn't uh, mean to confuse the issue. Thank you, apologies. Uh, I was gesticulating uh, to be uh, muted. Um, uh, we, will, we will get back to you on the timeline for the report. We're absolutely aware of the report. Um, I don't have the specific timeline on hand, but we will get back to you um, uh, on the, the timeline for the report. Absolutely. Yeah, that's not a good enough answer. I'm really sorry after two years. So can I just ask if you were, you know, um, one to 100% done on being ready to 
publish the report. Are you at 80%? Are you at 50? Do you not know? I personally do not know, but I will see if I can find out for you before the hearing wraps. Before this hearing wraps or before you leave the hearing? Um, How, is this a phone call, an email? If you could take care of it before the DOE leaves, that would be incredibly helpful to the hundreds of parents who are devastated by the length of time that it takes to get reimbursed just to send their kids to a school that services them appropriately because the DOE cannot uh, meet their needs. And it's been established and agreed to, and yet they have to go through a lawsuit to get reimbursement. And again, actually, I remember when I first came into office eight years ago that uh, I was assured that the system was being fixed and I shouldn't submit a bill because the system was being fixed and you were going to take care of it. So this is just a reporting bill. It's not, you know, it's a reporting bill. So can you, are you texting with someone right now? Yes, I, I am texting with someone um, and I do have some updated information for you. I do just want to say first that um, we are absolutely committed to continuing to improve this process. As you mentioned, we have made some uh, improvements over the course of the administration, and we, we know how important it is for these issues to be heard and resolved in a timely manner. So um, we are absolutely committed to doing that. Um, I'm hearing back from my colleagues that um, the report is about 75% done. So um, I will follow up on what we need to do to complete the remainder of it, but we will be able to get back to you shortly. Can you make an assurance to this committee that the bill will be reported on before the end of Mayor de Blasio's term? Let me let me confirm with my colleagues. Um, I am not the one who pulls the, the raw data for the report, so I just want to check on um, to make sure every, all the ducks are in a row. Um, I don't expect that it will be an issue, but let me just triple check. Right, because again, all we're asking for is the report. The report doesn't even mandate that you expedite. So I'm gonna end, thank you chair for the extra time. But I, you know, on behalf of all the families that are struggling, you know, I hope at least the DOE stays on to hear uh, what their testimony when they come on, cause they're gonna give you both specific and systemic information that is incredibly important. Um, and on the salary thing, just do it. Just do it. I don't know, just do it. It's that's I, an executive decision you can just do. I've worked at OMB, just do it. So, I, I, I echo that Councilmember Rosenthal, just do it because I don't know a time again when you will be in receipt of so much money that you are in right now. And again, this is time that our kids will never get back. And Councilor Rosenthal hit a couple of notes that I just want to reemphasize and just we'll wrap up with the administration here. Um, I want to share with the public what I hear from principals and school officials almost on a daily basis these days about why we're having some of the staffing issues we're hearing about here today. Uh, staffing, we have a staffing crisis. It's a, I wouldn't even just call it an issue. We have a real staffing emergency. Um, teachers are burned out. Staff are burned out. They're burning out. Uh, principals, school leaders, they're burning out. Um, again, I, I sound like a broken record here, but every single change, every program, every, everything that's come out of City Hall within the last two years schools have had to operationalize. They're at the front lines responsible to make this work. Parents are feeling the brunt. Kids, obviously, it's all about the kids. They're feeling the brunt. So I, I do believe that raising pay uh, can go a long way. It's not going to be the magic wand to solve everything, just to be clear. But I do believe raising pay for staff, particularly in the moment that we're in, can go a long way to help some of these items and, and issues. Um, I also feel that parents and families who have been traumatized and re-traumatized 
not just by the pandemic, but, 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 but by the government uh, uh, poor decision making. They are reluctant to trust the government to keep their kids and families safe. Staff also reports to principals that, hey, I, I don't feel that the city cares about my health, cares about my safety. We've had colleagues die. You can't just erase that. That, that, that does not get erased by a tweet or by a cable show appearance at 7 a.m. That's real. So I, I, I really think that we need to immediately go back to the drawing board, make some substantial changes here. Number one, we need to, we need to increase pay. We need to resolve the special education preschool issue once and for all. Uh, we need to increase pay for staff for the recovery programs, uh, uh, Saturday and after school. I, I appreciate the fact that we're thinking innovatively about trying to increase the pool of staff, but we need to increase the pay for staff as well. I think we need to double down on communication efforts with families, particularly our multilingual families, who still many times have to rely on, on different parties. I mean, quite frankly, we have community-based organizations that I still feel are not tapped into, and local parent groups that are not tapped into to kind of help get the word out. I want, I want folks to know that it was a, a local uh, cornerstone program in my district that helped families sign up for tablets last year. It wasn't the DOE. It was a, a local nonprofit operating an after-school program out of a NYCHA community center that helped my families get tablets, just for the record. Um, so... Could we get a commitment that there is uh, that we can get a report back on our request? Uh, Deputy Chancellor, you mentioned that at some point soon there'll be a decision made about, uh, did you say decision made about pay parity for, or, or a decision? Can you just clarify what you said is pending soon? Uh, can we unmute Deputy Chancellor Wallach, please? Thanks, Chair Traeger. Um, we we anticipate that the that the um, the solicitation will go out soon, um, and then we'll need some time to um, to look at the responses um, and and respond on that, you know, and then come back on that basis. Um, but it'll happen in a short period of time. But that's the that's what I was referring to is that we hope to get that out in the world very shortly. Uh, I, I just want to note for the record that. Uh, this council really tried very hard. Uh, we tried very hard to resolve this issue once and for all in the budget process. And uh, there's no excuses. Um, we have money in the budget. This has to get done once and for all. And I apologize to families because I feel that we are, we are, we are not doing right by you. We have the money, there are just no, there's no more excuses here. And there's a new day in Albany. We have a new governor, fortunately, that actually acknowledges the needs of, of, of our school communities. And there's no more excuse. We have a legislature that understands this as well. Um, there's no more excuse. Um, we, we really do agree that it's a priority. We wanna make the most of this moment as well. And I, I hope you don't leave thinking that it's not as urgent a priority for us as it is for you. We're uh, going to be Chancellor, I, I know, that, I know yeah. that you know that. I, I, yeah. I am not. I, I'll, I'll be I very clear. I hold, I hold the mayor, I hold City Hall accountable because ultimately that's where the buck stops. We're under a mayoral control system. That's where the buck stops. And, and uh, budget negotiations should not have been as challenging as they were this past year with so much money that we have. So it's very frustrating and upsetting that we're still going th through these motions. And also to we're Kevin Moran, Kevin, I, I, you know, I heard your answers about getting this up and running as soon as possible. And I know that you, we, Kevin, you work around the clock. I want to again say that I, I, I email Kevin 11 o'clock at night and he gets back to me. He, he works around the clock. I appreciate him. But Kevin, just to make a real public plea to include bus service for kids in, in, in temporary housing and foster care, even if they don't have an IEP, all of our kids have extraordinary needs right now with or without IEPs. Kevin, can, can I hear an answer on that? 
Yeah, it's the first thing I'm looking at when I get back out of this meeting is the, the population, the numbers, and the services we can provide. Absolutely. I, I share in your advocacy. Um, and uh, so I don't know if this is Warren or someone else who can answer. Um, can the administration revisit their outreach plan to talk about a plan to actually partner with community-based organizations and provide resources to them to increase partnerships to get fam to get the words out to families in you know culturally appropriate ways and to, sp to speak their language to kind of build to help try to rebuild trust because trust has not been spoken about today but it's a it's an underlying I issue that I think is an undercurrent in this conversation trust between the families and schools teachers and their and their school communities principals and so forth can is there a commitment to uh, look at increasing partnerships with CBOs uh, to uh, increase family engagement outreach to get families informed and sign up for these services. I'm, I'm happy to take that back, Chair, absolutely. And Warren, that includes increasing pay for staff? I will absolutely be sharing your feedback um, as we look at a whole range of options. Okay, uh, with that, I don't see... Uh, any further questions from my colleagues? Uh, and uh, seeing none, we will now uh, turn to our further witness panel. I, I thank the administration for uh, being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Grudenchik. We will now begin public testimony. For our public panelists, after you are unmuted, please listen for the Sergeant at Arms to give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. Please do not read your testimony verbatim. All written testimony will be read by committee members and committee staff. So please be sure to email it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Testimony will be accepted for 72 hours following the close of this hearing. The sergeant will prompt you when your two minutes is up. At that point, we ask that you please wrap up your comments so we can move on to the next panelist. First, we will hear from Lori Pudvesker, of Include NYC, followed by Maggie Mora, the Arise Coalition, Randy Levine, Advocates for Children, and Kate Hoy, AHRC New York City. Lori, you may begin. Time starts now. Hi, everybody. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Chair Traeger and your amazing supporting staff for your leadership and commitment um, to all our kids, but specifically the hundreds of thousands of students with disabilities. Um, our system is in a better place because of all of you. Thank you. Um, I also feel a little pressure not to read my testimony because that's what I was planning to do. So bear with me. Um, sadly, much of what we have to say, we've said many times um, and said it last at a um, hearing by the Education Committee of the Senate in October. Uh, I looked back at uh, testimony from a year ago um, about remote instruction and the impact of COVID on our kids. And sadly, you know, there are the same threads, which is uh, communication with families and kids not getting the services that they're legally entitled to. Um, you know, prior to the pandemic, we've known there have been um, long inequities between general education students and students with disabilities. There was a 32% uh, difference in graduation rates um, the last time we uh, have data. Uh, COVID has only worsened existing problems um, and many of our students did not receive a quality education the last 20 months. We appreciate the city's overall academic recovery plan and specifically their special education uh, recovery services initiative, um, but with the date pushed back till December 6th, it's unacceptable that the city continues delaying vital services to students with disabilities to which they are legally entitled to and to first initiate these services three months after the school year begins. The intersection of these uh, extra special education services and how students will receive missed services, also known as compensatory, still remains unclear. We urge this committee to clarify how students receiving these extra services and their families will be protected under the federal- Time expired. The Individuals with Disability Act, since they are not funded through IDA, but are funded through a stimulus package. Um, I know I don't have a lot of time, but I think it's very important that history does not repeat itself, um, like what happened in the summer with summer rising and alternative transportation options being provided to families after it started and after decisions were made um, 
we urge the city to release that information now proactively and before um, programs start, whether they're blended or uh, in person. Um, we also want to highlight, you know, the persistent staffing shortages that we've already been talked about. Um, this includes school-based positions, uh, certified special ed teachers, related service providers, nurses, social workers, and we also need transition counselors still. Um, very often we don't talk about transition counselors, but there has never been a more important time than now. Um, you know, I think about these services for my own son who's 19, and sadly, you know, I've given up on the quality of instruction or his academics, but there is value in these services being in person, not only for the therapeutic aspect of it, but also for um, socialization and soft skills. And, you know, this was one of the few opportunities the city created for inclusion and that small group instruction could be provided to both general education students and students with disabilities together. But now that, you know, the majority of these services are going to happen remote or uh, blended, it's a missed opportunity. Um, and again, these are opportunities for kids like mine and the hundreds of thousands of other students with disabilities to gain skills that'll help them become employed and integrated into the community. Um, I've rambled, I just wanna say thank you so much. Thank you, Laurie. Next we have Maggie Mora. Time starts thank you. now. Thank you, um, good afternoon. I am here today on behalf of the Arise Coalition. My written testimony covers special ed service delivery and makeup services, but for my time today, I'm just gonna speak to the latter. Um, like Lori, all of this is gonna sound very familiar. Um, because of the pandemic, students with IEPs went without many of the services that they needed to make progress uh, during the last um, 20 months. In fact, many saw serious regression of previously obtained skills. And in the response, the city announced the recovery services that we heard about earlier. So while the details around those and compensatory services, which are different, will overlap, remains unclear, it's important that the DOE begin providing some of those services now. We know that some schools are doing it, but they're not all there. Um, and they won't be for another few weeks. We wanna flag five concerns around the rollout of those recovery services that need to be addressed in order to re render the additional supports successful. Um, in, in most schools, as you Chair Traeger noted, recovery services won't begin until next month. Next month, it should go without saying, but every day that passes widens the gap between students with disabilities and their peers. Um, those students need their services ASAP. Um, there's also been huge inconsistencies in communication with families from school to school. Um, we heard um, Deputy, uh, we heard Christina Foti talk about how important family communication is. It's really, really important um, and parents need to have the chance to help determine the extra support that their students will receive and that they require. It doesn't feel to us on the outside like that's happening. Uh, the recovery programs need to offer targeted, effective instructional interventions. So we were all told earlier that there would be literacy and math teachers at each school trained in evidence-based interventions, Time but that's been explained. walked back. We're hearing that that's been compromised and that's not okay, given what these services are supposed to do. Also, as you noted, um, prior to today, no busing had, pr had been promised for students who remain at their schools for recovery services. Without, it, without transportation, attendance will be impossible for many. Um, I heard Kevin Moran on busing and Christina Foti on alternative transportation services earlier and hope that um, what they said means there will be transportation services and that that's clear to families now as they're making their choices about whether or not to enroll their children in the recovery programs. Um, we're gonna be watching closely. I'm guessing you will too. Um, this is a citywide initiative, but details have been left very much to the schools. We know that some of them are gonna do this better than others and that students at schools with less resources or commitment will suffer just as they did before the pandemic, just as they did during the pandemic. Somebody from up high needs to be monitoring how the schools are doing, how the students are doing and make sure that the students get all the recovery help they need. I'm almost done, I promise. I also want to note that recovery services will be inaccessible or insufficient to many 
And the DOE is, as, as has been said already, the DOE is legally obliged to provide students with disabilities with full makeup services, whether or not they're available through the recovery services program at their school. I just wanna finish here and join all the other voices in saying thank you to you, Chair Traeger, and to the rest of the Education Committee um, on behalf of ARISE members and on my own behalf. Um, you've been great partners over these past years and we really appreciate you. Thank you, Maggie. Next, we have Randy Levine. Time starts now. For the opportunity to speak with you, my name is Randy Levine and I'm Policy Director at Advocates for Children of New York. Throughout the pandemic, Advocates for Children has heard from hundreds of families of students with disabilities whose needs were going unmet despite the hard work of many educators and DOE staff. Our written testimony describes examples of the needs we heard about last year and this year. While we appreciate that the DOE has allocated funding to provide recovery services after school and on, or on Saturdays, I need to echo the concerns that we've heard about the implementation and the sufficiency of these services. Among other concerns, we're troubled that the start date has been pushed back, that schools are now allowed to provide recovery services remotely when for many students, the need for makeup services stems from the ineffectiveness of remote learning to meet their needs, that parents have received insufficient communication and that it is still unclear which students will and will not get bus service or when bus service will begin, a necessary component for so many students to participate. In addition, the recovery services will not be sufficient to provide all students with disabilities with the compensatory services they have a legal right to receive to make up for what they missed during the pandemic. The DOE must issue clear guidance requiring IEP teams to determine whether each student with a disability needs compensatory services beyond the recovery services their school is offering. And if so, ensure that students receive those services in a timely manner. Develop a non-adversarial pathway for parents to get help if they disagree with the decision of their school representative and provide oversight and monitoring to ensure every student gets the compensatory services they need. Families should not be forced to file administrative hearings in an already overburdened and delayed special education hearing system in order to get the compensatory services to which they are entitled in cases where recovery services are insufficient or inaccessible. We appreciate the questions asked by Chair Time Traeger slide. and Council Member Rosenthal about salary parity for teachers at DOE contracted preschool special education programs. The city's preschool special education contract enhancement will not be successful if CBOs running preschool special education classes cannot recruit and retain teachers for their current classes, not to mention the new classes that the DOE is hoping this contract enhancement will bring. Teachers and staff at preschool special education programs work over the 12 month school year and serve young children with the most intensive needs in the city. The city must commit to paying them on par with their DOE counterparts. Our written testimony also includes some concerns we've been hearing as we get request after request to represent students with disabilities in suspension hearings. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and thanks as well for your leadership, Chair Traeger and the members of this committee over the years. We are so grateful for the attention and resources you've brought to all students, including students with disabilities. We'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Randy. Next, we'll hear from Kate Hoy. Time starts now. Okay, Kate Hoy, we will come back to you. Um, next, we will move on to Tom Shepard, Panel for Time. Education Policy. Time starts now. No, actually, uh, I, I see Kate, uh, just we have to unmute her if it's possible, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Very yeah. Much. Appreciate that, Chair Schrager. Uh, thank you. Let me try again. Okay. 
thank you, Chair Schrager. Hello, members of the committee. My name is Kate Hoy. I'm an education advocate uh, for New York City students with disabilities. I'm a member of the Arise Coalition, proud resident of Greenpoint, Brooklyn for 17 years. Just want to highlight two items of critical importance for students with more significant disabilities, uh, equitable funding for 853 and 4410 programs, and salary parity for preschool special education staff. And thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing much needed attention to these issues today. I'd also just like to offer my support for the testimony that my colleagues offered now. Um, in June, the Senate passed 6516A, Assembly passed 8013. They both passed unanimously in the Senate and the Assembly. It's now waiting the governor's decision. Thousands of New York City school students classified with autism, intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, emotional disturbance, and more are educated in these highly specialized, publicly funded schools. They are called approved non-publics. They are accessible only to students who are recommended in place by the local committee on special education and central based support team. These essential schools serve students with the most significant disabilities and yet they are severely and chronically underfunded. Many are closing. Many schools are struggling with a 30 to 40% vacancy rate for certified special education teachers, in large part because the state does not equitably fund salaries and tuition to support the retention of highly trained teachers and experienced staff members. I hear from parents every day. They don't know what they're going to do. This issue is fixable, but the time is of the essence. It may be too late for the council to pass a resolution in support of the bill, but I ask council members, please, to urge Governor Hochul to sign the bill in support of tuition parity for students at age and 4410 programs are called New York City and State. I also ask council members to urge the mayor to commit to salary parity 4410 program teachers and staff at preschool special education programs as part of the contract enhancement that you discussed at length today. And I just wanted to thank the community, uh, the committee again for the opportunity to testify. And I didn't see council member Levin here today, but I just wanna thank him also for his service to, to the committee and to New York City's children um, and to thank him for his service to district 33. So I wanted to wish him well, thank you. Thank you, Kate, for your testimony. I would like to remind council members who have questions for a particular panelist to use the raise hand function in Zoom. You'll be called on after the panel has completed its testimony in order that you've used the hand raise function. I would also like to remind members of the public that we are asking everyone to give highlights of their testimony within the two minute time span allotted for everyone. Your written testimony in full should be emailed to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Testimony will be accepted for up to 72 hours after the conclusion of this hearing. And we will now begin our second panel. Our second panel will include Tom Shepard, Panel for Education Policy, followed by Ellen McHugh, Citywide Council on Special Education, Paulette Healy, CCSE and Parents for Responsive Equitable Safe Schools, and Jennifer Choi, Parent Advocate Special Support Services. Tom Shepard, you can begin. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, I want to, um, one, uh, thank you uh, or thank Council Member Traeger, uh, Council Member Riley, Council Member Rivera, and members of the committee for allowing me to speak today. Um, I would respectfully ask that if we're having a conversation um, about the impacts of uh, education on our children, that the direct representative for those parents be given a little bit more than two minutes to speak. It's just a respectful request. Um, you got it. Yes. Thank you, sir. So um, with that, uh, my name is Thomas Shepard, and I am the CEC president appointee to the New York City Panel for Educational Policy. Uh, I wanted to thank you for allowing me to testify today, and I am here as a voice for thousands of parents across this city who have been demanding a remote option for their children since May 24th when Mayor de Blasio announced on CNBC, by the way, that schools would be reopening in September with no remote option for students. I'm really sorry to sound harsh, but I've heard the DOE dodge numbers all morning. But I wanted to start with a really specific number, 8,633. That's the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases that have been reported in New York City public schools since September 13. I started there because some would use that numerator over a denominator of a one plus million uh, school system of teachers, students, principals, and staff to downplay the seriousness of what we're witnessing. And I'm here to explain 
the impact on our lives. With hundreds of new cases reported every day, parents are rightfully concerned that their children's schools are unsafe. I have been hearing stories from parents who are justifiably fearful that changes in policies would now allow classrooms and schools to remain open when they would otherwise be closed, placing their families at risk. I am terrified that a completely subjective widespread transmission policy that kept PS 166 in Queens open until there were almost three dozen cases reported in two weeks. I am deeply concerned that staffing shortages have created environments where school administrators have to make impossible choices. By the way, I'm one of those 8,633 positive COVID cases. Test and Trace showed up at my door and gave me notice literally five minutes before the October 6th panel meeting. I had to quarantine myself during that time or during that meeting and separate myself from my family for 10 days. And I did that because a school delayed reporting of a positive COVID-19 case for almost a week, placing an entire school community at risk and placing me and my family at risk. And having personally lived through that experience, I'm angry that parents are being coerced into unenrolling their children from school and having ACS cases put on them for educational neglect. I am, and I am profoundly saddened that a child has died because of COVID-19 since the start of this school year. I believe this environment exists because Mayor de Blasio and the Department of Education has refused to allow remote option for our children. In desperation, parents have worked with this committee to call on the DOE to implement a remote option. I would like to publicly thank all the members of this committee and the majority of the city council for standing with parents. But it didn't end there. Parents have also worked with Senator John Liu and Assemblywoman Nathalia Fernandez to introduce 7381 and 8283 requiring the Department of Education to provide a remote learning option to New York City public school families when the transmission rate is at a substantial or high level. I respectfully ask that the committee unanimously adopt the resolution calling on the state legislature to pass this and Governor Hochul to sign 7381 and 8283 into law. In closing, I would like to leave everyone with this. COVID-19 has been traumatic for all of us. The past 20 months have brought disruption, pain, suffering, and loss to New Yorkers from across this city. Some have been able to recover, but others are still struggling. This is not about politics. It's about people. We'll get through this if and only if we support each other through, if we support each other through it. And that support includes having a remote option for our students and families. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. We will now hear from Ellen McHugh. Time starts now. Good morning or good afternoon, however it works. Um, I'm here as a representative of the CCSE, although I am not speaking for the CCSE because we have had discussions, but we haven't come up with a unified statement. A unified statement will be sent within the next 72 hours. I also wanna remind the council that when elections occurred for Tom Shepard's position on the PEP, the citywide council, four of them, were not allowed to vote because the DOE's interpretation was that the law said CECs will vote, not citywide councils. I'm also here to echo the concerns raised by my colleagues, including Kate Foy. Our 4410 schools are in great danger and without any sort of assistance from either the state or the city, they will be seeing cascading closings, 90 day notices that the schools will be shut down or ending in June. The other part of this, and as it's been said before, is the lack of communication. It is a serious issue. There is an existing network. Each of the 32 CECs has an IEP representative. 
There are two councils, District 75 and the CCSE, who provide information and referral and resources to families. To the best of my knowledge, at no time were any of those councils or council members consulted as they should have been in the development of the programs. No one is saying that we would have disagreed with the programs, but creating these programs required parental input and it was denied. There is already, as I said, a network Time expired. Poor, poorly used by the, by the system that created it. I don't know how else to say it, but the DOE ignores the very people that they insisted on putting on these councils. Written, sorry, a written statement will follow. And thank you for the time and thank you for the interest and thank you for the effort on our behalf. Thank you, Ellen. We will now hear from Paulette Hill. Time starts now. Hi, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Yep. Um, I just want to start off by thanking Christina Foti and her team at the Division of Specialized Programs and Student Supports for staying on this meeting, unlike your colleagues who have left the minute um, the count, uh, our, our city council had no longer had questions for them. Um, I also wanted to thank Chair Traeger for starting this hearing by amplifying the persistent need for remote learning options. The thousands of families who are keeping their children home as they continue to demand a safer option despite ACS being weaponized against them, thank you wholeheartedly. And that includes myself because I do have an open ACS case against me, even with all of my resources and connections. So thank you, thank you. And Lucas thanks you and says hi. He wishes he could be here. Um, with over 8,600 positive cases reported in schools in winter, which equates to frigid classrooms right around the corner, the need for safer remote option is more prevalent than ever. That being said, the way the DOE continues to evade accountability time and time again on simple asks such as attendance numbers, staffing deficits, transparency on how outreach is being done, and busing speaks volumes on why our children are experiencing these deficiencies in the first place and continue to be disenfranchised by our school system. The philosophy to start planning transportation after the academic recovery services have already started is as asinine as offering food to those after they've already starved to death. Or to put it in DOE speak, building the plane as you fly it. We know who needs the busing. It's on their IEPs. We're not reinventing the wheel here. The majority of children in D75 fall under the tier one guidelines for academic support. 80% of D75 students are bused to their schools. Why don't you start scheduling buses for those 18,000 students now and reroute based off of attendance once the program started? That makes so much more sense Time because expired. it starts with need. Otherwise, it is just performative theater. The truth is, without busing in place prior to the rollout of these programs, we'll prevent these tier one students from participating, period. And that is a violation to their civil rights because you are depriving students with IEPs the same access as their general education counterparts. We would not deny a hungry, children, uh, a hungry child nourishment. So why are we denying the, the same children the DOE so famously say they are prioritizing the same consideration? The failures of OPT affect all of our families. Just to amplify that, this came from a 17-year-old student who filed her own complaint. She suffers from cerebral palsy, and after sitting on a bus for three hours, she said, I quote, by the time I got off the bus, I was in tears. My legs were almost numb to the point of giving out. My head hurt, I was spinning, and my stomach hurt so bad it felt like someone had stabbed me repeatedly. Our students deserve better. The DOE needs to do better. And I did notice that JD, Jody Salmon from OPT is there, so this is directed to you, Jody. Lastly, $40 million in contracts were approved last night at the November uh, Panel for Education Policy meeting. And I said this last night at the PEP too. Hundreds of families are still waiting for reimbursement for transportation needs since the abysmal rollout of pupil transportation from summer rising and D75 summer session. Roll out those reimbursements. DOE do better. Thank you. Thank you, Paulette. We will now hear from Jennifer Choi. Time starts now. 
Thank you, members of the council and Chair Traeger. My name is Jennifer Chet. I am a parent of two autistic students with IEPs in, Queen, in Queens. I'm also a special education advocate with Special Support Services, a parent-led advocacy consulting group. Today, you are hearing a lot about the problems of special education recovery services. And for sure, I too am a parent of a student with an IEP that's having trouble securing these services. But I wanna tell you about one avenue of support that has worked um, and that has been the special education inbox. It's special education at schools.nyc.gov. Parents on the ground have been telling me that escalating their problems to this office has helped. And in some cases, a lot. Uh, it's not perfect, but you know, it does help. So I ask, I ask this office all the time for complaints about my own family or for my clients. It's actually way faster than filing a due process complaint. So um, this tells us two things, I think. Our city needs a special education ombudsman to allow investigation that goes beyond complaints, also, but also investigate patterns of frequently occurring special education problems or a school continuing to be a source of complaints, including impartial hearing requests. I think the public would like to see this information. Um, additionally, if the city wants to say that students with disabilities are at the forefront of their agenda, then we need the head of special education at the deputy chancellor level, like it used to be before Richard Carranza became chancellor. One out of five students have an IEP. That's not including the students with 504 plans. When our children's rights are violated, their issues cross into many departments at the DOE, including the Office of Enrollment, the Office of School Planning, Office of School Climate and Wellness, all of these departments are headed by deputy chancellors. We need the special education office to be elevated back to the Time cabinet expired. to ensure that the $236 million for compensatory services not go to waste. The IDEA is being enforced without parents having to hire a lawyer. And most of all, that our children's dignity is protected. How schools treat children with disability tells them how much they're valued in the city. Thank you. Jennifer, I want to thank you because I couldn't have said it better. Uh, I had submitted a resolution, some folks might remember, a couple of years ago, calling for exactly what you've just said. Uh, someone in DOE, and I, I'm open to titles, and, but my main thing is someone at DOE at the senior level with power and authority to cut through red tape to go to any office in DOE, whether it's OPT, whether it's general counsel, whether any office in DOE, and get things done for our children, and while at the same time inform parents proactively, not reactively, of their rights and the responsibilities of DOE. This has been uh, an issue plaguing uh, the DOE for years, and, and the former chancellor said to me, because we discussed this resolution, because of mayoral control, I don't have the power to force them to create it, which is, which is really a shame. But he said to me, Chancellor Carranza, that councilman, I believe that everyone is responsible. And I come from the school of thought that if everyone's responsible, then no one's responsible. You need a point person, clear chain of accountability uh, to, to get this work done. So I, Jennifer, I could not have said it better myself. Thank you for that testimony and really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. That concludes this panel. We will now hear from Michael Mulgur of UFT. Time starts now. Good afternoon and thank you so much for having us. And I really, uh, I am with you, uh, Chair Traeger. I, I thought Jennifer Choi's uh, testimony was spot on because this isn't just about uh, special ed recovery. Special ed recovery has been well documented. It is not working. The idea was correct. We spent hours and hours in July and August laying out an entire year plan on how to deal with what we felt was coming, which was our children with IEPs having even more damage. Um, you know, that was our educational judgment. There could be a real issue where that there was more damage there and we needed a special ed recovery program. It was supposed to take out, start in a very slow way with a lot of training, a lot of training in the end of August, beginning of September, actually starting engaging, engaging in each of the students, 
But instead, what happened, it's been all consolidated into a very short period of time as if it was done for some, a political need to say, check the box, we did that, uh, instead of actually doing it in a thoughtful way that both the UFT, the CSA, Mark Hanazaro and his team, we all worked on this together, and all of the things, the timelines we worked on were thrown out the window uh, within two weeks of the school year starting. And it was, it was set up to, in the way they were, the timelines had changed, knew it was not going to be successful. But we're still going to continue to do this work, uh, despite all that's been thrown at us. But as I said, this goes a lot deeper. This is, there is a reason the state has us under a corrective action plan for special education. And I can tell you all right now, we have more, we have already the same number of valid complaints in less than a quarter of the school year than we had all of last year. And you would think, oh, last year was hybrid remote. No, the services still had to be delivered. And there were quite a few uh, issues because it was how we were delivering the services, what was legal, and all those things were questioned. We already have more, the same amount of valid complaints as for all of last year. So I appreciate this hearing and I am, I loved what Jennifer Choi said. She is correct. We need an independent person to be looking after the, the special education because we're about to get, as a school system, in a lot of trouble. We're under a corrective action plan and things are getting worse, not better. And, and President Mulgrew, I want to take this time to thank you and your members. And I, I want the public to kind of hear why on this issue. Um, you know, we've heard a lot from UFT members, obviously, about working conditions and unsafe conditions, issues of COVID and so forth. But the cases that I get, many cases that I get of children not getting the bus, uh, the bus service, uh -huh. buses coming late, buses missing, certain staffing issues plaguing the schools, a lot of it comes from UFT members. A lot of it comes from Uf UFT uh, chapter leaders and so forth who are going above and beyond their services for their own profession but fighting for kids and families uh, throughout the school and their districts. So on behalf of certainly of this committee, I wanna thank you and the UFT for not just fighting for your members, but really this is about the children and the neighborhoods and our families. So I wanna thank you, Mr. Mr. President Mulgrew for that. And I glad, I'm glad you brought that up because let me tell you, be, the, our members do this and believe me, there is a lot of retaliation for members who bring, who bring these things to the forefront. And mm -hmm. that's why we have a union. But there should never be retaliation when somebody is saying a child is not getting their services. This should be, yeah. how do we get the service? But the system would rather squash the complaint about a child not getting their service rather than deal with the service for the child. And that's what's wrong with it. That's why an ombudsman or something like that is a very, very good idea. Yeah, it was the UFT members that brought to my attention. There's a a D75 school in my district where a bus company didn't show up several weeks, almost no accountability, and they went above and beyond. They brought it to my attention. I called Kevin Moran, and that company is now being assessed on financial penalties. And that was because brave union uh, folks, brave teachers, went above and beyond their responsibility to make sure that that got out there and we held them accountable. So I, I want the public to know that. Thank you, President Mogru, for your words. Thank you. Felicia, as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge um, that we were joined by Council Member Salamanca um, for our next panel. We will be calling Rashida Brown Harris, Amy Sai, from New York City Coalition for Educating Families, Jennifer Godard, New York City Coalition for Educating Families Together, Beth Igrao Heller, Parent Coalition, and Isabel Mavridez Calderon. Rashida, you may begin. All right, it starts now. Thank you, can, am I, can, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Rashida Brown Harris here. I'm a parent leader, equity and education advocate, and a proud member of the Healing Center Schools Working Group. Thank you, Chairman Traeger. Um, I don't have much to say, y'all. We've been around this rodeo over and over, I'm starting to feel like it's just, you know, Groundhog Day. Um, but I just, I, I needed to join in when I heard my brother Tom Shepard speaking, when I heard Ellen and Paulette 
uh, Miss Aaliyah, you know I was not on all morning. I was listening live stream doing a million other things, but when I heard my people speak, I said, let me join in. I signed up to testify and uh, and I just really want to stress the fact that we really do still have families struggling. Um, a lot of children are struggling with returning back to school. Um, we as a society must do better. Um, a our schools, we need to reach out to these families and try to support and figure out what it is they're going through to really support them processing this whole return to school, return to society. Um, there's folks who are still just hunkered down in their homes, um, believe it or not, and just not out and about but our babies need to get back into the schools. And if we want them back, we have to work with the families. We must um, provide counseling sessions for the parents and the caregivers and the children to help them process everything. We need the support for our school staff as well. We still have a lot of school staff in person, afraid and just full of anxiety going through things. We must do better as Paulette Healy said. Um, but while we're figuring it out, we've got to offer a remote option. There's too many of our children who are just home, waiting, waiting, waiting. Families are waiting um, on the um, home, you know, instruction um, approval or reapproval. Um, it is not healing centered. It is not culturally responsive. Um, when we sit here and just say, back to school, that's it, no other option. So I beg you all to please continue to fight and advocate um, for a remote option. It is not too late. We're in November going into December. We can still roll it out. And families who are home, we can get them to log in remotely so they can continue to build virtually. Um, but we've got to pour resources into the services to help support and figure out, you know, how we can really, really help them um, understand what's going on. There's a lot. We all know. But thank you very much for listening. We've got to continue to fight and advocate for a remote option. Please, you know, council members, whatever y'all have to do, whatever we have to do, we're here with y'all. And we just got to keep fighting for it. We just want that option for families who really want and need it. We've got to provide it. Thank you very much for listening. Peace. Thank you, Rashida. We will now hear from Amy Sai. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Um, City Council Member Traeger and members of the committee. I just wanna say thank you so much for your advocacy. Um, I am a, a vice president of the New York City SEFT. I'm also a CC member for our District 75 community for our students with disabilities. I'm also a mom of three of my five children who have uh, IEPs. Um, I, I'm hearing all of the other parent leaders and advocates here who talk, you know, talk the desperate, uh, dear uh, issues that our students are, are going through with transportation and with uh, the academic recovery services and all of the other stuff that we need to make sure that our children are receiving uh, to meet their needs and their goals. Um, we are very close to almost two years. We're actually um, two year anniversary of COVID-19 um, being in this unprecedented time. Um, we need to make sure that we are not repeating the saying that we are doing for summer rising. Uh, we are. We want to make sure that we are not in the movement of continuous crisis, but a movement of uh, really making a recovery actually happen. Um, as we know, um, this is assessments of a plan to ensure that how many students will be able to be provided in the academic recovery plan, but yet there is no transportation for our District 75 students in order to have access and opportunity to participate in this. And it's really unfortunate that to hear thousands of kids who are still not receiving a bus route or adequate uh, appropriate route to get to school on time and to leave on time um, to go home. And so, you know, we talk about two folds, one being the student transportation issue and second is the instructions when we talk about meeting their needs, related services, um, daily living skills, working work programs that were lacked from last time year. Expired. These are things that our District 75 are really in dire and we hear that every single day and we need to make sure that we are not just uh, 
you know, making positive steps, but really making change so that we are not stuck in this for decades. And as student transportation has been for decades, we need an improvement, we need a plan, and we need our elected officials to really come out and offer a remote learning so that the access and opportunity are offered to these families to have an option. Again, this is the time now to give the uh, academic recovery plan and not to wait till January in order to have transportation right now offer parents the option of remote learning. If these children can benefit after school or Saturday for remote learning, the maximum number of time, not just 10 hours for the entire three to four hour, three to four months, that's not enough. So I appreciate you hearing me today in this space. Thank you for your advocacy and your leadership and uh, have a good day. Thank you, Amy. I'd also like to remind council members, if you have any questions, please use the hand raise function in Zoom. I will now call on Jennifer Godard. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I want to thank my colleague, Amy Sai from the New York City SEPT, and thank Councilman Traeger and the city council members again for being advocates and I thank the DOE members who did stay on and I continue to ask that they hold their colleagues accountable and say you need to hear what these parents and families have to say about our children. So I'm, I applaud the city council also for the resolution and hope that New York State Legislature will pass them and the governor will sign the bill requiring remote learning option for any school district in a high transmission area. The remote learning option would solve so many of the problems that we've discussed ad infinitum in these uh, settings. Being in remote um, helped my medically fragile fifth grade son excel while remaining safe and receiving his mandated services from his IEP last year until this year when the mayor refused to offer the remote learning option. So he's been in medically necessary instruction that the DOE has provided since September 13th. And despite assurances from the DOE that this program would be expanded beyond the one hour per day of instruction that he receives, it has still not been expanded. And I've had to compensate for his learning loss by paying for classes through outschool.com. Um, and I only just recently received vouchers, me, the parent, to secure mandated services for him for his IEP. And only after I asked about these services, where are they? Uh, I've heard nothing about compensatory services, even though he's been in school 48 days and he's missing 15 hours of mandating services. And I'm very confused as to why, if he's in a DOE program, why he wasn't automatically being provided these services? Why wasn't this prepared? Why is it my responsibility? Uh, you know, in addition to the insult of a paltry one hour per day, now I also have to go out and look for the speech language therapist and the counseling and the outreach. It, it, this is not acceptable. This is this is abysmal. You know, um, and I've heard from the school that he's eligible for special education recovery services. However, Time they're only by. in person and they're only a fraction of what he is currently owed backdate so to me i'm disgusted i'll wrap this up now i just want to reiterate how disgusted i am by how horribly the city and the doe has failed to educate and support the most vulnerable students in this in this time of need it is a stain on the city's leadership and the doe and i'm going to make it a point to always show up and remind whoever needs to hear it that when parents like me needed most and asked for it mayor de blasio and the doe refused to step up Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for your testimony. We will next hear from Beth Evro. Hello. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Um, thank you, Jennifer. You actually made me cry. Um, I want to thank uh, Chair Ch uh, Traeger. You have been um, incredibly pointed in your questions, and I sincerely appreciate you and all the efforts that the council members have made today and to date and today to hold the DOE accountable. Um, and I also echo everything every advocate and every parent has said thus far. I can only speak about my experience. My son is almost 11. He's a 2E learner, a sixth grader attending a DOE approved non-public school in Queens. We are profoundly grateful for his placement at this school. We were always worried about the distance of him getting there uh, where we from where we live in Brooklyn, and it has been problematic. For the past two years, he's endured 7 a.m. pickups, excessive ride times of two hours or more, routes with stops to disparate neighborhoods, recent changes to his bus route, Joe Faz 829. They've been myopic, 
benefiting one child while negatively impacting multiple children on the same bus. Recently, it's basically a proverbial game of whack-a-mole and the route has since been combined with another. Because I'm a squeaky wheel and I have a history of being a squeaky wheel in uh, District 13, uh, I've documented the uh, all of my problems with the OPT, the Office of the Public Advocate, everyone I can possibly find and think of within the DOE and OPT, um, of course, his school administrators, I'm in constant contact with them. But I have to say our dedicated OPT rep that our assistant principal deals with, I hate to say it, the man is feckless. And I don't say that lightly. He comes up with myopic solutions. There is zero communication and there is no escalation within the DOE. You get sent into a vacuum and have no idea who you can turn to. You feel as if you're screaming into the wind to just try and get your child to the school that the DOE has agreed to send them to, to give them their mandated services that they are entitled to. I'll be quick, I promise. Um, so the latest solution is that I was offered Ubers to school by Limosis, which is part of the Accessoride. I can't tell you how frustrating this is and how much money it wastes. Um, not only am I dealing with a different car every day, I'm getting into a different Uber driven by a different driver. They can refuse the drive, uh, the, the call and not show up. Or I'm dealing with a car service, don't know where they're coming from. Generally speaking, the drivers have been great, but I had one without a mask. I had one who was a dangerous driver and his car was filthy. Not to mention, I have to go with my child. I have to be in the car on four legs there and back twice a day. I spend four to five hours in the car and I cannot pursue my livelihood, which I was not able to do during COVID because I'm a freelance photographer. And now I can't pursue it. I had hoped to do that since he is now able to get vaccinated. So I am not able to make a living in the way that I choose. So there's safety, there's my inability to work. There's also excessive cost. There was a no-show. Uh, just yesterday afternoon, stranding me in Queens. I had to call an Uber myself. Unfortunately, I have the means and ways to do that. It cost $60 before I gave the driver a tip. So if the DOE is sending my child to school back and forth, and they send four cars to get me there back and forth, that's $240 a day times 180 days in the school year. That is $43,200 for an academic year to send one child to one school from Brooklyn to Queens. That is an enormous waste of money and taxpayer dollars and resources. And as we are obviously now going to be in wash in funding, there has to be massive oversight. There also needs to be oversight of the bus companies. Are they fulfilling their contracts? Are they, are they paying their drivers and matrons and paras a living wage? These are all questions that have to be answered. And given the responses from the DOE, I have no idea who's going to provide that information. I wholeheartedly support an ombudsman and someone who can hold all of the, the different disparate communications that need to happen, hold all of the departments within the DOE and OPT accountable. Everybody is siloed. Decisions are random, myopic, and there is no communication. Last, lastly, the administrators at my son's school one, they can't take a public face on this because most of the students come from the general population of parents, by the way, who can't afford to spend $70,000 on a private school and wait three years for reimbursement. The DOE has agreed to pay for these schools and our schools can't be perceived to bite the hand that feeds them. But more than that, our administrators who are specialized in working with special needs children are being taken away from that task by having to deal with the ceaseless and pointless, consistent problems with busing. So obviously our children's rights are being trampled on, both their civil rights and their disability rights. And the bottom line is they are entitled to their education and they are entitled to the services that they need to be fully, fully reach, to fully reach their potential and also to maintain the well-being of our families. Families haven't even talked about the struggles that they have raising children with special needs. So I will end here. I have more that I could say, but it's in my testimony and I will send it. Again, I sincerely appreciate what everyone has said here today. And I implore you, fix this. If we cannot take care of the most vulnerable among us, 
what does that say about us as a society? We would be lost if we don't take care of our children, all of our children. And I'm here to amplify the voices of all the parents who do not have the luxury to make this crusade a full-time job like I am so fortunate to be able to do. Thank you very much for your time. And I will see you again because like my advocacy in District 13, I plan to be at every meeting and my wheel will continue to squeak. Thank you. Uh, I wanna thank you, Beth. Uh, this has been some of the most powerful and it, it hits you right here. It hits, uh, I think many folks know what I'm feeling, what we're all feeling right now. Um, and you hit on so many things that we have been raising and trying to amplify for years. The, the, the DOE is siloed. Um, this is by design. This is not by circumstance or by accident. This is by design. I have figured this out myself as being a teacher, now chair of the committee, and so many things that you raise are common sense and others in uh, Jennifer, who, who in her testimony as well, it's such common sense, but it is by design because they want to shield themselves from accountability or liability. Uh, and you know, they, and we, in reality, and I said it before during uh, the exchange with the administration, we have a system that basically a budget is deciding on what services we're giving kids rather than the needs of children deciding what budget we're going to have to meet the needs of our children. They don't have an excuse anymore. We are in receipt of billions of dollars, more than we've ever had. More is coming for education. There's no excuse. And, and, I, and I firmly agree with you and others who have said, we need that, that senior level position that is empowered with the, with the power to go into an office and say, this has to get done, not please work on this or please call this person, get it done. And, and, and how are we proactively, proactively communicating with school families across the city in languages they speak, meeting them where they're at, informing them of their rights, in my district, we actually supported in a school, PS212, something called an IEP binder party. I was invited to an IEP, I loved it. Families from across my district, different languages and so forth came out and there's an organization that, that helped run the workshop. And it was beautiful to see a community come together, learn about their rights, empowering themselves and others so they could also be a resource for others. That's how, that's how this should work. It shouldn't be a council member trying to figure out how to connect the dots. The DOE, that's their responsibility. So thank you. That was some of the most powerful testimony. It really hit home. I wanna thank you very much, Beth. And please keep showing up, keep speaking up because we hear you and, we're, and we, we will get this done. I, I am, I'm a believer that we will get this done. Thank you all. Thank you. We will now hear from Isabella Mavides Calderon. Time starts now. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much to Tara Traeger and the Committee on Education for holding this incredibly important hearing. I'm Isabel Marvides Calderon. I work for the nonprofit Patients Rising. I'm a disability rights activist. But most of all, I'm a high school student that lives with chronic illness and disability myself. I strongly support the resolution to keep a remote option during this pandemic. But I also believe that we need a remote option beyond this pandemic for the sake of accessibility. Before this pandemic, disabled and chronically ill students would have to miss incredible amounts of school whenever they were hospitalized, whenever they had surgery, whenever they were in a doctor's appointment. And then suddenly during the pandemic, we got accessibility and we were able to join school and zoom in and have this accessibility we never had before. The graduation rates for disabled students are much lower than non-disabled students. And this is partially because they don't have an option to be with their classmates and peers. But if remote learning, we got that. But now we're reverting back to our old patterns and we are ripping this accessibility away from disabled students. What they're getting now, home education, hours of school completely separate from their peers is not the least restrictive educational environment. IDEA mandates disabled students are educated alongside non-disabled students to the maximum extent possible. And this is not what's happening anymore. Before 
we now know that there is a better option. We know that we can have remote or learning. And by not providing this, we are not following the spirit of IDEA. With long haul COVID and disabled student and more disabled students coming up, their disability is just going to increase with this pandemic. And now more than ever, we need to be supporting the most vulnerable students. We need to keep remote options. We can do better. We know this is possible. And we are leaving behind the one in four people who are disabled by not keeping remote option permanently. Thank you so much to all the parents advocating, everyone here. Your testimonies are so powerful and this is how we are going to make change. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. That concludes this panel. Again, council members, if any of you have questions, please use the Zoom hand raise function. We will now move to the next panel. It will include Jennifer Rodriguez of Collaborative for Inclusive Education NYC Charter Center, Shade McCall, Opportunity Charter School, Jacob Kapustin, Knowledge Road, Gianna McGinnins, Lauren Clavin, and Eileen Izari Ramirez. Jennifer, you may begin. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger and members of the City Council. I'm the Inclusive Education Specialist at the Collaborative for Inclusive Education within the NYC Charter School Center and a career special educator. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony today. Currently, we have 272 charter schools representing over 26,000 students with IEPs. The DOE is the LEA for NYC charters. Currently, the DOE contracts with agency providers that work directly in charters to provide related services. While there have always been shortages, the pandemic has exasperated this. It is clear from our conversations with schools that providers that work for these agencies are often compensated at a lower rate than those working within district schools. This pay disparity disincentivizes agency work and has led many providers to leave for more permanent positions, creating a system where students with disabilities enrolled in a charter are inherently at a disadvantage due to the likelihood of them not receiving services or services being of subpar quality. Given the mentioned agency shortages, RSAs are being issued at an even higher rate than in previous years. This practice places the burden of finding providers on families with little to no support or follow-up from the district and often results in students not receiving services. This has been historically documented as an issue with racial and socioeconomic disproportionality. This school year, RSAs have been issued to families even to fill paraprofessional vacancies. Supporting these students is the responsibility of the district, not a family trying to navigate a difficult system and now responsible for finding their child a para to work at their charter. It's clear this system should not be what the LEA relies on. We know that this is a time of crisis and have partnered consistently with the DOE. We would also like to partner on accountability to ensure that all students under the same LEA are guaranteed FAPE. We ask that the same data that is available on district school special education services be made available to all about the provision of services for charter students. We hope that coming out of COVID, there will be a real opportunity to strengthen partnership between the DOE and charters. We'd like to seize this opportunity to bring back and strengthen the district charter collaboration that has been steadily pulled back under the current administration to ensure students with disabilities disproportionately impacted by this pandemic get all they are entitled to. Thank you so much for hearing us today. Thank you, Jennifer. We'll now hear from Shade McCall. Time starts now. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, my name is Shade McCaw, and I'm here today on behalf of Opportunity Charter School, uh, where I am the deputy head of school. Uh, Opportunity Charter School, or OCS, is a school located in Harlem, grades 6 to 12, and our student populations, we serve 65% of our students have disabilities. And additionally, 88% of our students are economically disadvantaged. Uh, our students require a great level of academic and emotional support, which is why we have one social worker per grade level, one learning specialist per grade level, small class sizes, and also a school psychologist. As a school, as a charter school, we're able to provide students with more specialized services that has been reported public schools aren't able to provide, such as counseling, speech, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. Based on our experiences since March of 2020, we found it's deeply important for our students to be in the classroom. Our teachers work tirelessly to provide an experience to in-person learning with all classes conducted with live instruction during the peak of the pandemic. Just last year, 92% of our seniors graduated on time. This was because of their fierce desire to learn and our teachers' incredible support. From holding open office hours in Google Classroom to Wednesdays being a day where students had individualized schedules to support with intervention and social emotional needs, staff ensured students received what they needed in order to learn. 
However, these methods do not come close to the support that can be offered in the classroom. In-person learning allows for our students to have structure and consistency they need to succeed. From what we've seen since we've transitioned back to school is that it is essential for students with disabilities. We're able to give stronger and targeted intervention while also immediately addressing their diverse academic and social emotional needs that can only be comprehensively met in person. During remote learning, our 10th grade students did struggle academically and social emotionally. We did intervention to clean parent and student town halls, frequent check-ins, community building activities. However, they still continue to struggle. Time but now that we're back in the building, they have done a tremendous turnaround and they are very successful 11th graders especially for those who come from lower income households and who may not have the resources at home to succeed. Many of our students have gone through a tough time during the pandemic. We have students who lost family members as well as whose parents were first responders. They greatly benefit from being surrounded by their peers, teachers, and the greater school community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Shade. We will now hear from Jacob Kapusin. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacob Kapustin. I'm the founder and CEO of Knowledge Road. Uh, Knowledge Road is a mission-driven sets agency that has been servicing hundreds of students with special needs across New York City. During, our co uh, during COVID, our community was faced with a host of issues, one of them being remote learning. Every child has different needs and challenges. Remote learning has made it much easier to locate providers for after-school cases and it did work well for some students. However, many of our students struggle with learning disabilities that get in the way of learning in a remote environment. Parents uh, had no choice but to sell for remote services, even though their children weren't getting much out of them. During COVID, the Department of Education shut down and stopped replying to agencies and providers in regards to paperwork, payments, and even students. Due to the DOE being shut down, many agencies went out of business, didn't pay their teachers or lowered their rates. Teachers were going from making a living wage to pract being practically without a job. In addition to payments troubles with agencies, they were having trouble getting students to join Zoom. So many teachers um, might have had a full caseload pre-COVID, but post-COVID, they, you know, they can't get their kids to join Zoom. So they don't have, they're not able to bill enough hours to make a living wage. Um, Knowledge Road is proud that during COVID, although the delay in payments were, were really difficult for us, now one teacher was put out of work or it was anyone making less than before COVID. We also continued bringing on more students, even though we were not sure if we'd be around the next school year. Post COVID, there's a huge teacher shortage this year, our recruitment department has had a much more difficult time finding teachers because many teachers aren't vaccinated, are concerned to work in person, and many have left the profession entirely. Uh, I'm gonna be quick, I'm finishing on my last paragraph. Uh, the need for services grows every year and Knowledge Road has been servicing exponentially more students every year. When COVID hit, we were helping more and more students, paying our teachers well and on time, providing online teaching materials to our providers and doing everything possible to have a smooth school year. However, the DOE still owes us 40% on our invoices from last year and 25% from two years ago. Why is it that a company that cares about its families and teachers must fight to survive year after year? Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacob. We will now hear from Gianna McGinnis. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, the New York City City Council on Education for holding this hearing um, and Chair Traeger for your dedication to advocating for equality in special education. This is indeed a critical topic. Um, however, my son with a disability has never had his needs met in public school, uh, even before COVID. In the first few weeks of his kindergarten year, I was made aware the school was struggling to manage my son Fox in the classroom. A uh, crisis para was assigned to him. He was labeled a flight risk. Uh, I was scared and confused and unsupported and I agreed to have him evaluated by the school psychologist. I was in complete shock after the, um, at the initial IEP meeting when my son was classified with an emotional disturbance. Um, 
the experience was not the same as his uh, pre-K or even 3K and it didn't ring true with how I saw my son. Um, the report from the school psychologist and my son's teacher said that my son was resistant to rules, defiant, known to tantrum, behave aggressively, engage in attention-seeking behavior with varying academic success depending on his mood. Uh, that he is hostile, emotionally disturbed, aggressive, and depressed. Not one single statement that I just read to you describes my happy, silly, bright son. I pleaded with the school for a reassessment. I saw that he was working hard to achieve literacy that was in line with his peers. I could plainly see that his brain did not process information in the way that the school was teaching him. And this caused him stress and further exacerbated his anxiety reaction when his educators met his requests for help with skepticism. I know my son and I knew this report was inaccurate. So I went to an outside source and paid out of my own pocket for him to have a full neuropsych evaluation at my own expense. Uh, the independent assessor reported that he found Fox friendly, cooperative, engaging, and well-related. Ultimately, the assessment and subsequent assessments have diagnosed my son with dyslexia, not emotional disturbance. The examiner found that when my son was presented with a literacy skill that he felt he should know, that he had recognized that his peers knew, he became anxious and frustrated, which is apparently perceived by aggression. Um, in, in, was in his school. Speaking specifically to academic recovery, my son, um, my son's IEP goals were set while he was still in kindergarten and while he still had the, um, the incorrect classification, he's now in second grade and appropriately classified with a learning disability, but, but we haven't updated his goals. There hasn't been a reassessment. So when the administrators were assessing data to assign him for academic recovery, they had inaccurate information and they placed him as low priority um, because he's met his kindergarten goals. <laughs> this is not an accurate representation of the academic gap, which has significantly widened in the remote setting. This is absolute, there is absolutely no urgency in the process that is absolutely critical, particularly at this young stage of his academics. Um, as you know, New York City has roughly 200,000 students with disabilities. 5% um, of these students are labeled as emotionally disturbed, which is categorically stigmatizing on young students with support needs. It will undoubtedly follow their academic careers potentially beyond their academics. Um, in this classification, 50% of students identify as Black, 38% identify as Latino or Latinx. This is alarmingly disproportionate. Labelizing already marginalized students with a classification that is stigmatizing only enforces current patterns of racism and oppression. Black and brown boys that are struggling in our school system are labeled as bad. If my son had white skin like I have white skin, I wonder how hard I would have had to advocate to get him support for his language disability. How can special education needs be met when we don't have accurate, unbiased assessments. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jana. We will now hear from Lauren Clavin. Time starts now. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger um, and the rest of the council members. I'm not gonna read from my prepared statement. A lot of it I've said here before and um, my fellow parents today said what uh, I wanted to express about the need for a remote option. Thank you, Tom Shepard and Paulette Healy and Amy Sai and Rashida Brown-Harris. And thank you, thank you, thank you to the student disability rights activists who showed up here to speak. Um, I don't know if anyone from the DOE is still here. Um, Ms. Fodi, if you are here, I hope you listened to what that student had to say. Um, that is who you all say that you are prioritizing the needs of, and she is saying that she wants a remote option. And she said it brilliantly and very clear. And um, I'll just quickly, I I'm a parent 
of two children. I participated in the uh, strike for safe schools. I have a child with multiple disabilities and an IEP and uh, underlying health conditions that um, made it impossible for me to send him back to school this year. And um, I wanna thank Jennifer Goddard for illustrating, unfortunately, why I didn't even bother applying for the home instruction option. And I think what she shared um, shows why that doesn't work. So thank you for sharing your story. Um, and I'm currently uh, no longer actually enrolled in a, a DOE school. My children are, are no longer enrolled in, in DOE schools because it was made very clear to me um, with you know subtle language that um, there would be uh, an ACS call made if I didn't return my child to school. And as a former foster parent, I've had enough contact with ACS to know that I didn't want to invite that again. And I really want to stress here to anyone I'm that has never... Fine. To anyone that has never had ACS involvement in their home, you cannot understand the terror, the absolute terror that it inflicts on an entire family, the trauma, the emotional abuse that occurs at the hands of people who, who call themselves uh, representatives of, of child welfare, which we know that they're not, but that's a different story for a different committee. Um, so I felt that I had no choice but to unenroll my children. And I'm now homeschooling, which is not something that I had, I had wanted to do. I want my children to go back to school. As I said, um, just th thank you to all the parents. And I hope, and I hope that, that uh, any, any DOE employees here are listening. And I thank you, Chair Traeger, for continually um, opening these spaces. Uh, as you said, this is a failure. It's, embarrass it's embarrassing. It's a stain on the city. Like you, I, I, I blame the mayor. And uh, this will be his legacy. Um, and that, that I could say more. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. We will now hear from Eileen Itazari Ramirez. Time starts now. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Eileen Irizarry Ramirez. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I have a child with special needs. I advocate for parents and children with special needs. And I was in a meeting last night and then a meeting previous on the day before where OPT just doesn't take responsibility for nothing. The DOE, really, you guys don't take responsibility for the problems either. And they just got a huge grant, another, no, 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 more funding yesterday was voted in. Meanwhile, I have parents who cannot put their children on these buses. I'm not even talking about not having a bus route. I'm talking about their safety. Why are there not cameras mandatorily put on all of these buses? Most of our children cannot speak for themselves. A lot of these children are nonverbal. And then you have the children who are verbal who tell their parents they were hit on the bus by a matron and the parent follows protocol, calls OPT, calls the busing service, reaches out to the school and there's no resolve. The parent is told, you have to be patient. You have to you know, give us time. Or my favorite one was from the bus service itself. You weren't there, I wasn't there. And the matron has no recollection. I'm gonna believe my child, right? You would believe your child. My question is better training, better funding, you know? In that aspect, there has to be better training for the people handling the children on these buses. There has to be some sort of money put into those cameras. They have to be there. It's gonna to come to a point, my parents are not gonna go this route. And then you're gonna have parents on the news for being physical for protecting their child. It's an animus, it's an instinct to protect your offspring. Time expired. And they're not allowed to. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. That concludes this panel. If we've missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call you in the order your hand is raised. I'm seeing none. 
Chair Traeger, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing, handing it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, as well for stepping in today and doing a great job helping moderate. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, really much, much appreciation to you. Thank you. Uh, and and, and to, uh, to the entire staff. We, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's no way to sugarcoat this. Uh, we, we, we are failing and uh, we're failing and uh, the entire government needs to take responsibility here. Uh, we keep running into a brick wall of mayoral control in terms of what we can legally force, but uh, we're gonna continue to use this platform as mentioned to create a space for families and folks to speak up and rightfully advocate. Uh, we just want, I want the public to know that they cannot use the excuse of resources anyway. Historically in the past, they could have used it here and there, even though when there's, when there's a will, there's a way, but now we are in receipt of billions of dollars. More is coming. Um, there's no excuse anymore. And I think I heard some powerful stories today. Um, you know, thinking of creating a busing, a bus program three months into school is like the equivalent of offering someone who's starving to death food after. That's, that's the fact that, that, that our kids were not centered to begin with. That's already an indictment because we've heard time and time again, equity, equity, equity. That, that was not the case. Um, we have a lot of, and I know folks at uh, DOE, some folks are still listening and so forth. There's no excuse. And I know that there are folks in DOE who agree with us I know that uh, the issue is City Hall, OMB, the mayor's office, um, and, and we're not gonna give up. And uh, also uh, to those parents and families, educators who have emailed me stories, please email me, mtrager at council.nyc.gov. Every case I get, I follow up on uh, with Christina Foti uh, if, if need be. And also I wanna acknowledge her on the record. She does respond to me. She's one person. I wish I wish she was more empowered and had more power uh, in the administration. She does get back to me. Kevin Moran does get back to me. But but this 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 should not be a piecemeal thing. This need we need to have a more comprehensive uh, approach here. Uh, so we have more work to do. Uh, I have some follow up questions from this hearing. Um, forgive me. Uh, we have some work to do. I have some follow up questions from this hearing, uh, which we expect to get answers from from, from the administration and we'll share uh, with the public accordingly. Thank you all for your powerful testimony, for your partnership. We have a lot more work to do. This hearing is adjourned.